Good morning, good morning. I know you are waiting for the snap. When is Shreya sir coming? And Shreya sir is here. Hello, Krishna. Hello, Madhumita. Hello, Aishwarya. Yeah, welcome, 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 everyone. I hope I'm audible and visible to all of you properly. Nice to see all of you out here. Yep. So you know, morning classes has its own charm and has its own fun. You guys are all fresh, and now that your schools, colleges, everything are almost over. and you are just probably done with your exams so it's high time that we also utilize this morning time for our classes yes you have your biology classes in the evening or in the afternoon and uh, let's utilize this time to cover up as much ground as possible in the days to come so this is your final over this is the last over of your super 6 super 6 we got inspired from you know cricket and we launched the series because six day classes so this is the final over where we complete whatever is remaining all right so this is very rare on youtube to complete a series so let's begin with this lecture and today's lecture we are going to start with elasticity we will go to viscosity we will have a break and then we will go to surface tension okay is the flow clear it's a flow right elasticity solids then viscosity these are the two concepts before the break surface tension i will teach you after the break so it's a big lecture maybe around 3 o'clock we will try to finish everything or 2 o'clock yeah small doubt in current electricity difference between emf and potential difference emf is given by the battery all right it is a work done to move the charge around the circuit all right but potential difference can be not just across battery it could be across capacitor resistor inductor anything it's just the difference of the voltage okay so that's what it is a battery can create a voltage difference but emf is only there from a battery which converts chemical energy into electrical okay so let's get back to our topic yes krishna gokul nice to see all of you so make sure that many of your friends who are not yet a part of the channel or who are a part of the channel but are not regular they get back on track as well so remember one more thing if you are living in one of the cities where vedantu learning center is present just give a visit over there uh right there are a lot of workshops for free of cost which are being conducted right over there pay a visit because that's where you get personalized uh, learning you get the course the batch which is required for you in a very different manner because there are beautiful libraries doubt counters digital boards clickers fun way to learn the topics all of this is happening so that you actually get your desired dream college and you, no matter which part of the country you are you will probably see some center around you so if you are or if you can please visit one of these centers you can see all these centers are mentioned over here i have been visiting few centers i'll be visiting more centers in the days to come hopefully to see all of you and one more additional thing about the offline courses are even the online courses in vedantu which no other institute gives is the vip promise which is vedantu improvement promise it's a commitment that you are rank your scores will improve and if it doesn't then the money is refunded no institute can claim this very few can actually do and we are one of them and we are proud that we give this promise this assurance not just to the kids but also to the parents so go visit the center you will definitely love it now starting off with elasticity yeah okay. yep definitely guram that is the hope if you could not crack neat in the last 50 60 days i wouldn't be teaching here i would have stopped the channel right i would have been like okay leave it it's okay not possible why should i waste their time chuma let them enjoy i'll also enjoy no i have hope i have faith in you that is the reason why i'm coming here interatomic and intermolecular forces this plays a very important role in elasticity what is this chapter all about see this particular chapter of elasticity this particular chapter of elasticity and solids this chapter is all about deformations is all about deformations which happen no body in this world is perfectly so rigid that no matter what you do it doesn't change its shape or size 
at least little bit it will deform like if somebody presses your cheek your cheek gets deformed if you press maybe the clay the clay gets deformed if you bend a metallic strip it will get deformed if you press a wall it gets deformed although you cannot see it perceive it it happens if you take a microscope and see you will see the wall has been bent a little bit very 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 little but it is there even diamond cannot be spared even diamond will deform when you apply forces it's just that you cannot see it so easily but yes everything has got deformations now these deformations can be good can be bad can be used can be naturally occurring phenomena right and uh, when you design bridges when you design uh, you know your buildings these deformations play a very important role otherwise the buildings might fall off might bend might develop cracks even your bones have some bit of deformation when you are standing remember your height is less when you are sleeping your height is more how many of you knew this by about half an inch to one inch depending on your height your height will be different have you tried measuring your height how many of you know this fun fact how many of you know this fun fact yep <laughs> so what happens is when you're sleeping you're relaxed there is no stress there is no force there is no tension on your body but the moment you stand all the weight is going to compress your body compress the bones the muscles so your height slightly reduces that is the reason why your height is slightly different and this has to do with deformations elasticity and the solids part so you will see there are many many examples of elasticity in our day to day life now let's start with a pandu champa story out here so just imagine there is a pandu out here and uh, there is this beautiful champa there is this beautiful champa okay they are in a relationship and they are maintaining certain distance between them which is basically the equilibrium distance equilibrium distance they are maintaining and at this equilibrium distance the net force on them is zero they are satisfied they are very very happy let's say pandu pandu wants to meet champa pandu wants to hug champa so pandu tries coming close to champa champa also is missing pandu champa is also missing pandu so you know she tries to come close to pandu then she remembers no 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 what i'm doing is not right this way it complicate the relationship the moment they try to come close you know champa will push pandu away even pandu realizes if i get champa very close things might go bad things might not be as good as before you know i should maintain distance so the moment they try to come close what happens is what happens is my dear warriors there is a kind of a repulsion there is a kind of a repulsion which comes into play so they will be pushed away if they try to come closer so there is a repulsion if they come closer if they come close there is repulsion between them then one day pandu and champa fight with each other so pandu goes little bit far away from champa even champa is little bit angry on pandu so champa also goes far away from pandu you can see she is little bit sad out there what happens is as soon as they go far away they will start missing each other as soon as they go far away they'll start missing each other and their mutual love their mutual attraction will pull them together so there is attraction there is attraction when they go far away when they go away from that equilibrium distance and this is their love story when they come close they are pushed far away when they go far away they are being brought back they would love to be in their equilibrium as far as possible did you understand it yep did you understand this till this point very good very good now why did i tell you this love story because this love story is exactly what happens in case of any solid you take some device you take your phone you take your hand 
all the molecules of anything around you behave in this particular manner and that is why you get this rigidness, elastic and plasticity. Meaning what happens is if there is some kind of a solid that you have out here, all right, if you basically zoom onto it, you take a small part and basically you zoom onto it, what you are going to see is many atoms or molecules, many atoms or molecules of that particular solid or liquid or gas and just like them, just like them who try to maintain their equilibrium separation, when they try to go far away or close, they try to come back to their equilibrium. This behavior is like a spring, as if they are magically connected with a spring. Imagine Pandu Champa connected with a spring. Spring is elongated, it is brought back. Spring is compressed, it is pushed back. So it is like there is an invisible spring between them. So the same invisible spring exists between these molecules. The same invisible spring exists between these molecules. Understand that. So this is there everywhere. This is there everywhere. And I can keep drawing like that. Many more, many more springs everywhere. All right. So these springs are invisible which try to balance their equilibrium separation. Remember that. Which try to balance their equilibrium separation. It tries to maintain. So you can think of any solid that is around you, be it cement, be it brick, be it metal, be it plastic, be it rubber. All these things might look like a proper rigid solid, but actually it's really flimsy. It's like a matrix of masses and springs. It's a matrix of masses, these dots, which are molecules and invisible springs actually. So the moment you push something, the moment you push something, you will see the springs will get squeezed. And when you pull it, the springs will get elongated and it will try to restore it back to its original shape and size. Is that right? Everybody with me understanding till this point? As we get the yesterday's lecture notes will come. Don't worry about it. Perfect. Perfect. Narish will be doing wave optics next week. Don't worry. Okay. This week we'll complete few more topics of 11th standard. Wave optics will complete next week. Concentrate on the class. Concentrate. Answer the questions. Enjoy this class. Okay. Don't worry about other things. It is my job to complete everything. Okay. Don't worry. I'll do it. Now what happens in case of a rigid body is that there are you can think there are invisible springs, but these springs cannot extend, cannot compress. It is perfectly rigid. They do not get compressed. They do not get extended. So rigid body is basically incompressible, incompressible, incompressible or inextensible, inextensible. So what happens for such bodies is they don't, they don't change their shape they will not change their shape nor will they change their size nor will they change their size when when deforming forces are applied when deforming forces are applied on it are applied on it actually speaking actually speaking remember no body is perfectly rigid. No body is perfectly, perfectly rigid. Perfectly rigid. But, but we take examples, we take examples of like stone or let's say diamond and so much more are nearly rigid, are nearly rigid in nature. That means you will not see much change in their shape or their size when you apply some forces on them. Is that right, my dear warriors? Is that right, my dear warriors? Perfect, perfect. Yes. Is this phenomena true for all rigid body? Yes, Madhumita. Uh, so in basically rigid bodies, what will happen? These springs are like stuck. They can't extend they can't compress 
so you know the shape only can't change it's rigid it's like rods are connecting between these molecules so nothing will happen so that is rigid body so they will not be able to change their shape and size but in those bodies where you will see there are springs invisible like things in between the molecules or the atoms of the solid that solid or that object can easily deform itself those bodies are said to be elastic bodies and plastic bodies they will be able to deform elastic and plastic bodies can be deformed can be basically deformed both these bodies definitely they can be deformed by by external forces by external forces definitely but then what is the exact difference between elastic body and plastic body right what is the difference between elastic body and plastic body let's talk about it so let me make a difference table let me make a difference table out here elastic body versus plastic body what is the exact difference between these two what is the exact difference between these two i will give you an example probably you will get an idea of this elastic body is a rubber band is a rubber band or basically a spring or a spring example of a plastic body is like your cheese which is there on the pizza or the clay which you might have played with right these are examples of plastic bodies what is now clicking in your mind elastic means example rubber band spring you can deform it but when you leave it it will come back to its original shape and size like for example your friend might call you come let's go out somewhere right so you might go you might get distracted you might go out with your friend but at the end of the day no matter what happens you will come back to your home right so that is elastic behavior so i would say that the body returns back body returns back to original shape and size when deforming forces are removed when deforming when deforming forces are removed is that very very clear but then what is the meaning of plastic body your friend calls you you go out and you don't come back to your house only you stay there the, uh, your friends mom and dad only are helping you out you are bathing over there you are eating the food over there it's like you got adopted only to a new family you don't come back to the original house so that is plastic behavior that means the body the body gets permanently deformed body gets permanently permanently body gets permanently deformed deformed and doesn't return back and it doesn't return back to its shape and size it doesn't return back to its initial size or shape that is the meaning of a plastic body most of the bodies right will be either rigid plastic or elastic and they might have different different proportions of it like stone it is not plastic for sure well it is more of rigid and it is slightly elastic in nature meaning if you apply some force it will try to come back metal they are mostly elastic in nature they do not get so easily deformed permanently so you will see they come back they are not rigid definitely unless you have a very solid chunk of metal which is very difficult only to deform so there are these different proportions of rigidity elasticity and plasticity in different bodies is this very very clear yep no sujay this will not be the same because the questions are very very different you will see that all right now let's come to the different types of deformation because that is what is there 
mainly in this particular chapter and uh, let me tell you we are going to solve NCRT plus NEET PYQs in this particular lecture is that right and we are also going to do so what do you say surface tension as well as viscosity out here is that okay Sujay all right all right cool everything is clear give me a thumbs up let's move on now to the different deformation types now what is this different deformation types what do I mean by this see whenever you apply some forces the body might twist change its shape its size etc fundamentally or at the elementary level there are three major deformations which happen and that is what we want to study what are those fundamental basic building blocks of deformation that happen let's study that one is basically called as the longitudinal deformation longitudinal deformation the second type of deformation is called as the shear deformation and the last one is called as the bulk deformation so when you talk about deformation types these are the three types of deformation that basically happen around you anything and everything is a combination of these types of deformation so what do i mean by longitudinal deformation longitudinal deformation means imagine there was a rod like this imagine there was a rod like this okay and then what you do is you pull the rod so the rod gets stretched the rod gets stretched because you have applied some force on it so there is some stretching happening and there is deformation along that force the deformation is along that force and not just that you can see that the force is perpendicular the force is also perpendicular to the surface perpendicular to the surface on which it has been applied then that deformation is called as longitudinal deformation i can also compress it that is also okay but this is an example of longitudinal deformation me trying to pull the pen what is happening the force oops oh my god this just came out yeah the force is perpendicular the force is perpendicular to the surface area and that elongation is happening along that force or perpendicular to the area that is longitudinal deformation i try to press something longitudinal deformation the columns of the building express uh, experience longitudinal deformation the bones in your body they are being compressed because of your body weight longitudinal deformation right you are hanging from a rod longitudinal deformation in your hands in your muscles that is the example of longitudinal deformation is that okay everybody with me right next is shear deformation now shear deformation means that you have a body you have a body and that body bends because of the forces the body basically bends like this because of the force acting on it that is called as a shear deformation sometimes it happens you are standing on a stool and somebody pushes you the stool bends like that that is a shear deformation or you take a cardboard box and you push the upper surface the upper surface slides with respect to the lower surface that is a shear deformation so it is bending it is bending you are taking a rod and you are hanging something onto it you can see it bends like this so the force is parallel to the surface force is parallel to the surface here the force is down the surface is here it is parallel to it it bends that is shear deformation are you able to visualize this right and you will see that both these kinds of deformations both these kinds of deformations mainly are used with respect to solids usually you use it for solids usually you will use this for solids but this bulk deformation is the only deformation which you generally use for gases or liquids gases or liquids imagine that you have a liquid or a gas and you change the pressure of the liquid from outside or change the pressure of the gas from outside and maybe the gas expands maybe the gas basically expands like this okay maybe the gas expands because you have changed the pressure etc so that deformation is called as the bulk deformation or that deformation is called as a bulk deformation and this kind of bulk deformation is mainly 
usually used for usually it is used for liquids and gases is this very very clear the three different types of deformation longitudinal shear and bulk these are the three elementary deformations which we will be studying in this particular chapter okay great okay right right very good let's move on now now to understand these deformations better we need to study the concept of stress as well as strain we need to understand the concept of stress as well as strain in fact the way to remember this is stress is basically stress is basically the cause the cause and the strain which is there is basically the effect that you see the cause will always be the reason for the effect this will be coming first this will be coming next yes they both are related to each other we'll be coming to that but stress is the cause and strain is basically like the effect you can think of stress as you can think of stress as you can think of stress as the stress is nothing but the intensity of the force intensity of the force in the sense the symbol for stress by the way is sigma the symbol for stress is sigma intensity of the force means how much force is there per unit area how much force has been applied per unit area to cause that particular deformation you will see that force is in newton area is in meter square so the unit oops so the unit of this particular quantity will be newton per meter square or you can also write it as pascal this is in si system newton per meter square which is also one pascal that is the unit of stress it's the intensity how uh, sharply or how uh, evenly the force is you know distributed if it is distributed on a very large area stress is less if it is concentrated in a very small area the stress is higher understood guys what is the meaning of stress how much force has been concentrated per unit area so think of think of you know let's say uh, area like this think of an area let's say like this and let's say the force is acting here in this manner here a lot of force has been applied on that same area a lot of force has been applied on the same area here i will say it has less stress here i will say it has more amount of stress because a lot of force has been concentrated in that area i hope this is clear homo sapiens i heard you bacha you can put it up in the comments but yeah please don't spam like this please concentrate on the class i'll definitely be making videos don't worry great now we can see because there are three types of deformation there will be also three different types of stress based on whether it is longitudinal deformation whether it is shear deformation or whether it is bulk deformation how does that work let's have a look let's have a look observe this carefully observe this carefully imagine this rod is there like this let me just make it like that this is a rod like this and maybe you pull it by some deforming force and that force happens to be perpendicular to the surface and the deformation that is happening is also along that force then this is longitudinal deformation we just studied this this is nothing but longitudinal deformation this is nothing but longitudinal deformation and this force has been applied on this particular area has been applied on this particular area that you see over here this is the area on which this particular force has been applied right great so if i say that this area is nothing but a then the longitudinal stress then the longitudinal stress what will it be the longitudinal stress will be that perpendicular force which i have applied upon the area on which it has been applied so force divided by area 
is the longitudinal stress acting on that rod which has been longitudinally deformed is that okay this also works for compression don't think that this is only true for uh, you know your uh, elongation so even if even if the rod gets compressed even if the rod gets compressed like this even if the rod gets compressed like this and this is the area on which you are applying that force obviously this will be compressive in nature then also it is the compressive longitudinal stress which is acting on it because it is just compressing it that's all so it's longitudinal stress is the perpendicular force on that area perpendicular force on that area upon the area itself the next one is for shear the next one is for shear my dear warriors so like I said, you have to bend that particular solid. So imagine this solid was like this. Imagine this particular solid was like this and it bent and it bent in this particular manner, maybe like this, like so. Okay. So the surface which I'm referring to over here is this one. Look at this, the one on the top, the one on the top right over here. So what happened is you have applied a force which is parallel to the surface area which is parallel to the surface then you will say that the shear that the shear stress is that force which was parallel to the area upon the area again it is newton per meter square or pascal is the difference clear yep will the sign change for compression Yes, some people also like to put some signs saying that longitudinal stress is positive, compressive stress is negative and all that, but don't do such things. Some people might just do it for the sake of doing it, but as such do not put signs. We will put stress as a positive quantity. We will always use stress as a positive quantity. Is that okay my dear warriors? Paka. So don't, don't put any signs, whether it is elongation or whether it is compression, don't use signs, always go with the positive value or the mod value or the yeah positive difference, right. So this is your shear stress. The next one, the next one is for the bulk and this is for particularly for gases and for liquids. So imagine that there is a gas like this. And let's say the gas expands the gas expands whenever gas expands it is because the pressure has been reduced if the gas compresses it's because the pressure has been increased on the gas or that liquid that is why it is compressing so basically there is a change in the pressure it's not like there was no pressure here there was pressure there was some pressure on this 100 percent there was some pressure on this 100 percent right you can say that this was the pressure acting on it but maybe now the pressure has been reduced that is why it has elongated or it has expanded the liquid or the gas so there is a change of the pressure so the bulk stress bulk stress the bulk stress is always the change in the pressure not the pressure many people write it is the pressure wrong it is the change in the pressure on that solid or that gas or that liquid because a pressure cannot change the shape or the size when you change the pressure that will uh, that is what will cause the elongation compression etc that will cause the deformation so delta p is what bulk stress is all about so that is nothing but your change in the pressure the change in pressure the change in the pressure this word is very very important change is that very very clear my dear warriors thank you krishna jsp for all the love from andhra miruela nwaru okay right let's move ahead let's move ahead so we have studied all the three types of stresses longitudinal stress shear stress and volumetric or bulk stress sometimes you might see that bulk is also sometimes referred to as volumetric volumetric okay so don't 
don't get confused that so volumetric is this something new no it is the same thing people just call it as volumetric sometimes sometimes they also call it bulk like you have pet names at home or at school now we just covered what is shear shear uh, uh, sorry we just covered what is stress stress is basically the cause of the deformation it is the intensity of the force the force is what causes the deformation how intense it is defines the cause which is the stress the strain is the effect of it so let's see what strain is and how it has been defined how what is strain and how it has been defined all right so strain strain is nothing but strain is nothing but the relative relative deformation is a measure of the relative deformation which is experienced in fact the symbol for strain is epsilon and it is usually the change of the dimension the change of the dimension upon the original dimension upon the original dimension that is the meaning of strain that is the meaning of strain change of the dimension upon original dimension meaning imagine something is 1 meter in length i elongate it to 1.1 meter change is 1 0.1 original is 1 so 0 0.1 by 1 0.1 is the change original is 1 that is the strain that is how much it has been relatively deformed with respect to its original shape or size and obviously it is unitless obviously it is unitless and dimensionless unitless and dimensionless very very important okay so keep this in mind it does not have any units or dimensions because both the dimensions will get cancelled if it is meter meter cancel centimeter centimeter cancel just like we had three different types of stresses shear oops just like we had three different types of stresses shear bulk and longitudinal same way same way just like this we will have three different types of strain we'll have three different types of strain over here so let me just show them to you when you have a rod like this and you elongate it in this particular manner so there is a change of the length let's say i call it as x let's say the original length was l then then the strain which is being produced the strain which is being produced which is the longitudinal strain is given by the change of the length upon the original length the change of the length upon the original length is the longitudinal strain which is produced i have strained it that means i have changed the length with respect to the original length it could be positive it could be negative remember that if it is positive that means it has been elongated let me put it over here the signs for this if it is positive then it has been elongated you have elongated it and if it is negative if it is negative then you have basically compressed it then basically you have compressed it that is the difference is that okay if it is positive you have elongated it if it is negative you have compressed it then let's talk about shear in shear case imagine this solid was there like this and that solid gets deformed in this particular manner in this particular manner so clearly you can see that it has shifted by some amount let's say it has shifted by x amount and the surfaces which are sliding with respect to each other the difference between them the layer separation between them is let's say h is let's say h h is the separation between the layers one layer uh, slided over the other layer by an amount of x then the shear strain why shear because they are sliding strain because we are taking the effect the relative change is defined as x by l is defined as x by sorry h x by h x is the movement h is the separation between the layers in fact you can do one more small thing over here 
if you just draw this line if you just draw a perpendicular line over here you can see this is h and this angle over here is theta so you can see tan theta is opposite by adjacent so actually this will also become tan of theta this will also become tan of theta remember that okay so that is your shear type of strain that is your shear type of strain yes srinath we'll be coming to lots of lots of problems after this and just completing the theory because the theory is very straightforward and simple to understand yes isn't it don't worry we are going to see all applications then when you talk about volumetric imagine there was a gas or a liquid like this and maybe it expanded maybe it expanded it could also contract so definitely there is a change in the volume as compared to the original volume you can see there is some change in the volume out here so the volumetric strain or the bulk strain whatever you want to call it is how much is the change in the volume upon the original volume how much is the change in the volume upon the original volume if by chance this is positive that means the gas or the liquid has expanded if it is a negative if it is negative that means it has basically contracted it has basically contracted that is the difference between positive and negative sign for a strain remember stress does not have sign it's the strain which we uh, associate some sign with it is that okay with all of you everybody with me on this great great so say for example say for example i tell you i tell you listen a gas a gas of 5 liters expands expands or let's say i say contracts come on contracts contracts by 1 liter 1 liter then the strain involved in it is how much how much is the strain involved in it come on let's see if you want to calculate it strain is given by change in volume by original volume the change in the volume is 1 liter but because it has contracted shall i not put minus 1 over here shall i not put minus 1 over here what was the original volume it was 5 remember strain is a dimensionless thing don't have to convert liters into meter cube or cc or anything so it is minus 1 by 5 you can also write it as minus 0.2 minus 0.2 negative says that it has contracted you can also write strain percentage strain percentage is nothing but the strain multiply by 100 that's all so what is the strain it is minus 0.2 multiplied by 100 multiplied by 100 so how much will you get you will get it as minus 20% so the volume has changed by 20% minus sign says it has contracted so the volume has contracted by 20% that is the meaning of this is that clear everybody with me understanding all these pointers very good so we have calculated strain we have seen what are the different types of strain we have also seen different types of stresses be it bulk be it shear or be it longitudinal now the main thing which is the hooks law which relates the stress and the strain this is the main law and then we will start with the problems we'll start with the problems see my dear warriors we said when you apply a force when you apply uh, you know that force on that solid which is there which is elastic in nature it will deform so there is a cause and that cause was the stress and every solid will have its own characteristic so the deformation might be different amount like for example you pull steel rod hardly it might expand but you pull aluminum rod it will expand a little bit more you pull rubber it will expand even more so the same force on the same shape and size might deform different bodies by different amounts so that is what you will understand from hooke's law and hooke's law says within elastic limits within or i will just mention for elastic for elastic bodies for elastic bodies the stress which is being applied is directly proportional to the strain which is produced 
स्ट्रेस इज ऑलवेज रिमेंबर अप्लाइड बिकॉज इट इज द कॉज स्ट्रेन इज ऑलवेज द इफेक्ट सो द स्ट्रेन विच इज प्रोड्यूस्ड सो स्ट्रेस कम्स फर्स्ट स्ट्रेन कम्स लेट ऑन यू कैनॉट से ओ आई एम डिफॉर्म सर अप्लाई योर फोर्स ऑन मी नो यू अप्लाई द फोर्स देन आई विल डिफॉर्म अंडरस्टूड इट्स नॉट लाइक योर रिजल्ट कम फर्स्ट and then you sit and study sir so, i got you know 700 marks out of 720 so now i have to sit and study that will be funny you know imagine time ran backwards and you know your results come first now you are under tension oh i got 700 marks so now i have to study no it is not like that your uh, effort comes first your stress comes first and then the effect comes later on which is the strain over here understand so the stress symbol we all know is sigma so sigma is proportional to the strain so the constant of proportionality is called as the modulus is called as the modulus so into strain so stress by strain is the modulus is the modulus and this modulus is the modulus of elasticity modulus of elasticity this is a very very again important formula for all of you very very important formula for all of you and you can also very well see stress has units strain does not have units so hence the unit the unit is the same the unit is the same as that of the stress so it will be newton per meter square or pascal another important thing it is a material property it is a material property meaning aluminium will have different modulus steel will have different modulus marble will have different modulus your plastic will have different modulus so depends on the material depends on the material never ever think so or if i apply more stress will the modulus be more no modulus will remain same if the material is the same in fact if you increase the stress strain will increase stress and strain are proportional to each other the constant of proportionality is modulus which is different for different solids do you have to sit and by heart no just like you don't by heart coefficient of friction for different surfaces it will be given to you in the exam or they might give you stress and strain and ask you to calculate the modulus of elasticity so it's a value which has to be found out experimentally also remember one thing what do you mean by it has higher modulus higher modulus higher modulus means it is difficult to modulus implies it is difficult to deform it is difficult to deform such a body think about it modulus is more means you need more stress for the same strain you need to apply more force more stress to produce the same deformation so steel has higher modulus of elasticity than you know a simple weak metal like aluminum it's relatively easier to deform steel uh, sorry aluminum as compared to steel which is more sturdier so steel will have higher modulus and you will see aluminum will have lower modulus of elasticity so you have three different modulus of elasticity because there are three different deformations what are they first is the longitudinal stress by lo longitudinal strain by longitudinal strain this is basically called y which is nothing but young's modulus young's modulus young's modulus and obviously this is only for longitudinal deformation longitudinal deformation this is what you will use longitudinal stress by longitudinal strain is that clear young's modulus is the name of the ratio or the name of the modulus for longitudinal deformation if you divide shear stress by shear strain by shear strain the symbol that you will get is g that is also called as modulus of shear or rigidity modulus rigidity rigidity or shear rigidity or shear modulus rigidity or shear modulus this is only for shear deformation just like this one was for longitudinal deformation this is only for shear deformation 
So you should know this ratio and its symbol as well. Last one is your shear is done, longitudinal is done. Bulk stress, bulk stress by bulk strain, bulk stress by bulk strain. This is only for bulk deformation. This is only for bulk deformation. This ratio is given the symbol B. It is also called as bulk modulus bulk modulus bulk modulus right so this is only true for bulk deformation keep this in mind everybody till this point is it clear yes so Revrand channel like I said before modulus of elasticity is a ratio of stress by strain I apply some force I and I see that the object gets deformed so if I calculate the stress, I calculate the strain, the ratio of it will give me modulus of elasticity. It is a purely material based property. I will give you an example of this. Just imagine, just imagine, just imagine, I tell you, Young's modulus of steel, Young's modulus of steel is 2 into 10 to the power 11 Newton per meter square. Right? And then I would also tell you, there is a change in the length which is produced of 1 millimeter for a length of the rod which is 10 meters. Question is how much is the stress which is produced? Question is how much is the stress which is produced? What do you do to solve this particular problem? We all know that the stress by the strain is the Young's modulus. So therefore, stress, therefore, stress will be Young's modulus multiplied by strain but strain is not directly given strain is indirectly given because change in length and original length are given so change in length upon original length is basically the strain okay is the Young's modulus given to me yep it is 2 into 10 to the power 11 is the change in length given to me 1 millimeter which is 10 to the power minus 3 is the original length given to me yes it is 10 so this will become 10 to the power minus 4 11 minus 4 will make it 7. So this uh, stress will be 2 into 2 into 10 to the power 7 but this will be Newton per meter square. That is the amount of stress which is produced. If by chance, if by chance they tell you listen the area is you know 1 centimeter square then what is the force acting on it? Then what is the force acting on it? Then what will you do? We know stress is nothing but force divided by area. Force divided by area. So that is 2 into 10 to the power 7. So force will be 2 into 10 to the power 7 multiplied by the area. But what is the area? The area is 1 centimeter square. 1 centimeter square. Do not keep it in centimeter. Keep it in meters. So that will be 10 to the power minus 4 meter square. This will be in meter square. So what will happen? This will become 2 into 10 to the power 3 Newton. So that is the force acting on that steel rod to elongate it by 1 millimeter. To elongate it by 1 millimeter. Is that clear? Revant, Channel and others. How Young's modulus can be used or can be calculated. The problem can be reversed. Force is given. Find Young's modulus. Or you know, uh, Young's modulus and force is given, find the change in length. All those variations you can do. Mainly it is related to these simple fundamental formulas. Stress by strain is modulus. Stress by strain is modulus. Stress by strain is modulus. Just that their symbols are different, that's it. For longitudinal, it is Y, Young's modulus. For sliding, shear, it is G, rigidity modulus or shear modulus. For volumetric deformation or bulk deformation, it is B which is useful for liquids and gases. Is that okay? Everyone with me on this? Very nice. Very good. Clear. Oh, awesomeness. This is also done. This is also done. So let's see some questions on Young's modulus. Then we'll go to shear modulus questions and then let's go to bulk modulus questions as well. Right? Okay. Let's go to that. Let's go to that. Let a wire be suspended from the ceiling okay and stretched by some weight at its free end 
the longitudinal stress at any point on the cross sectional area A of the wire is how much? So think of a diagram, you will get the answer. This is the wire and it is supported from a rigid support over here and you can think as if there is some weight which has been applied W. So what will happen if you take any section, if you take any section out here, right, this weight, this weight has to be supported by the tension in the rod, has to be supported by the tension in the rod. At every point, you will see the tension will balance the weight because the string or the wire itself has no mass. It's only the weight which has been attached has some mass. This was asked in NEET 2023. So the longitudinal stress, which is the force perpendicular by the area, the force which is there on it at every single point is the tension and that tension is W. So it should be W by A. It should be W by A, which is option C. A lot of people think it might be 0, 2W, W by 2. No. Why? Everywhere the tension will be same. It is a massless wire that we have assumed and it is not even given the mass of the wire etc. So whenever such things are there, assume the wire or the rope to be massless. Every point will have the same tension and you will see the tension has to balance the entire weight which is hanging below or else it will fall or it will fly up. So it has to balance. Is that here? Option C for Captain Shreyas. Very good Krishna Madhumita. Awesomeness. Proud of all of you. Keep answering. I would love to know all of you, all your names, because when you answer the questions, that's when I get to know all of you. That's when I know, oh, this student was there. Or else you will just remain a hidden, silent student. I don't want you to be that. I want you to interact. I want you to make friends. I want you to also spam the answers in the chats, right? Spam only the answers, nothing else. Okay, moving on to the next one coming up on your screen. This was neat PYQ. This is also neat PYQ. A wire of length L, area of cross section, is hanging from a fixed support. The length of the wire changes to L1 when mass M is suspended from its free end. The expression for its Young's modulus is how much? Expression for its X modulus. Can you see? Similar concept is repeated multiple times in NEAT. That means it's a very important pattern, important model of question. So, wire length area length of the wire changes to L1 when the mass is suspended, the expression for Young's modulus. Young's modulus is stress divided by strain. Stress is that force per unit area. Strain is the change in length upon original length. The force which is acting on it, the force which is acting on it will be the weight of the rod. The mass is given, gravity is there. Obviously, uh, it will be nothing but mg divided by area. How much is the change in the length? Well, the length has changed to L1 from L. So the change will be nothing but L1 minus L. The whole thing divided by the original length, which is L. So this will become mg. This L will go on the top divided by you will have A over here and you will have L1 minus L. That should be the answer. Is such an option there somewhere? Yes, option C is there which was there, uh, asked in NEET 2020 guys. Such a straightforward question and you can see similar model has been asked, you know, multiple times. So that tells you it is a very important thing. Yeah, it is not option B, it is option C. Remember, the wire's length changes to L1. So understand the diagram. The original length, the original length was L. The final length is L1. So technically speaking, this one, is delta L which is L1 minus L. Lot of people made that mistake and wrote option B in the exam. They forgot this is not the change in length. This is the final length L1. It changes to, it changes to L1. Understand that. So play of words out there. Many people wrote B and got negative 1 even if you know the concept. So guys, when such a thing happens in your mock test or assignment or test series, what will you do? It's not the conceptual understanding which is the problem. It is the question understanding which is the problem. And you need to work on that. Sometimes you know the theory. You know how to solve it. But just because you read the question wrong, you will get the wrong answer. So you need to be careful about it. Right? Let's move on, my dear warriors. A structural steel rod has a radius of 10 millimeters and a length of 1 meter. A 100 kilonewton force 
elongate said this is in exercise 8.1 of your ncrt calculate the stress elongation strain young's modulus of the steel is also given okay modulus is given initial radius length is also given force is also given i think we can calculate each thing one by one say for example if i tell you stress stress is the force by area but since it is a circular cross section because radius is given i should put area of cross section as pi r square area of cross section as pi r square so this will be 100 kilo newton that means into 10 to the power 3 divided by pi into radius radius is 10 millimeters so 10 millimeters is actually 10 into 10 to the power minus 3 meters which is 10 to the power minus 2 meters so this will be 10 to the power minus 2 square 10 to the power minus 2 square that is what stress will be so you will see that after calculation it comes out to be 3.18 into 10 to the power 8 so the stress value comes out to be 3.18 into 10 to the power 8 that much newton per meter square that is the stress acting on it so stress part is done then let's talk about strain because after strain we can find the elongation so let's try to find out the strain on it we all know stress by strain is the young's modulus so strain will be stress by young's modulus stress is 3.18 into 10 to the power 8 young's modulus is already given 2 into 10 to the power 11 2 into 10 to the power 11 do the division 3.18 by 2 10 to the power 8 and 10 to the power 11 will make it 10 to the power minus 3 just check if your answer which is there is coming out to be 1.59 into 10 to the power minus 3 1.59 into 10 to the power minus 3 just check this out 1.59 into 10 to the power minus 3 remember strain does not have units so that is why i will leave it as it is lastly lastly the third part which is this one elongation we know strain is nothing but the change in length upon original length so change in length or basically the elongation is strain multiplied by the original length strain is 1.59 into 10 to the power minus 3 original length is 1 meter or 1 into anything is that number only so 1.59 10 to the power minus 3 meters you can also write it as 1.59 millimeters so that is your change of the length my dear warriors 1.59 millimeters is that understood how to solve this question very good very good very good excellent let's move on let's move on to the next question which is going to come up on your screen there is a copper wire of certain length and a steel wire of certain length both of diameter this much connected end to end when stretched by a load the net elongation is found to be this much obtain the load applied this is a very interesting question can come as a neat question as well so imagine this there is a there is a copper wire of this much length and steel wire of slightly lesser length let's say this is uh, you know copper wire let's say this is copper wire and let's say you have the steel wire after this right over here this is of steel one after the other both diameters are same they are connected end to end now when you apply a load like this when you apply a load like this what will happen do you think the same force will be there on copper also will it be same and steel also or do you think it will be divided in certain ratio the rods or those wires are in series one after the other i want to hear it from you in the chat box let's see how many of you get this will the force between the rods be same or will it be different will the force on the rods of steel and copper will it be different will it be same that is the question think about it carefully the rods are in series whatever force is there in raw uh, steel will be directly transmitted to copper and if there was one more rod after that will be transmitted ahead remember all the rods are in equilibrium they are not in translatory motion they are not accelerated motion 
So there is no unbalanced force. The Newton's first law says when the body is at rest, the net force on it should be zero. So whatever force is there on steel should be balanced. Whatever force is there on copper should be balanced. So everything is balancing each other. So equal opposite forces are there on everyone. No, it is not in some ratio. It will be same. That is the common silly mistake in this problem. So that is the reason why because they are connected end to end. Whatever force is there here, whatever is force is there here, whatever force is there here is going to be the same. Understand that. So the same force is going to be there on copper also. The same force is also going to be there on steel. Right? The same force is also going to be there on steel. Once this is understood, it becomes much easier to solve the problem. Copper wire length is given, steel wire length is given and stretch by load net elongation is given. So let's say the elongation in copper, elongation in copper is x1 and the elongation in steel is let's say x2. So if I add both of them, if I add both of them, what should I get? If I add their elongation, what should I get? I should get this as 0.7 millimeters. So into 10 to the power 3 minus 3 meters because that is already given to me. The total elongation, the net elongation. Net means the elongation in this plus elongation in this. So I'm just adding their elongations, I'm getting it. Another important thing which I can say that in general, in general, right, uh, since stress by strain, let me put it over here. Since stress by strain is modulus of elasticity, stress is force per unit area strain is the change in length upon original length this is young's modulus if i bring x up if i bring x on the top i will have force on the left hand side area is below it length has gone on the top y has come below y has come below x is fl by a y x is fl by a y so for the copper rod for the copper rod won't x1 be force which i don't know length i think i know which is nothing but 2.2 area both have the same diameter so i can just put area over here and y is uh, not given i think it is uh, given in the data steel is this much and uh, copper is something from the table they have used these values they have used these values which are given in the table in NCRT. I have not pasted the table in the given information. So for the copper, it is 1.1 into 10 to the power 11. For copper, it is 1.1 into 10 to the power 11. Similarly, similarly, you can say for the steel, for the steel, the elongation is force into what is the area? Sorry, what is the length? Length is 1.6. Area is going to be the same. Steel has 2 into 10 to the power 11. Young's modulus. That's it. I got x1 and x2. If I take the ratio, if I take the ratio of x1 and x2, if I uh, or or else I put x1 over here and x2 over here, won't I get f value directly from this? Won't I get f value directly from this? Just think about it. If I put both these things, so let's say from here I put uh, f into 1.6 divided by area into 2 into 10 to the power 11 and uh, this one over here f into 2.2 divided by area into 1.1 into 10 to the power 11 if i just add them i will get this as 0.7 into 10 to the power minus 3 take f outside take f outside area we can write it down one second i'll just write it down as pi r square radius radius will be how much diameter is 3 millimeters radius will be 1.5 millimeters so 1.5 into 10 to the power minus 3 the whole square the whole square right that is what it will be that is what it will be whole square that is what i have done i have taken the area outside and you can also take 10 to the power 11 outside as common so what will be left is just 2.2 divided by 1.1 2.2 divided by 1.1 and over here 1.6 divided by 2 and this is 0.7 into 10 to the power minus 3 everything is known over here except for the force you do the math do the calculation 
you will get the final answer okay the final answer comes out to be close to 1.8 10 to the power 2 so 1800 1800 newton that is what you are going to get it 18 so what, oh sorry what is it 1.8 right sorry it will be 180 180 newton my bad yeah 180 newton that is what you're going to get the answer as is that clear yeah yes yes Pavish. there will be different modulus that is the reason why i have kept the modulus different young's modulus is different for x1 and x2 first i got the basic formula of x then i wrote x1 separate x2 separate by substituting y and l separately and then i substituted in this equation so it became very easy to solve after this i don't think this problem will run out of your head yes krishna 180 newton got it Srinath, very good awesome so these are the kind of questions that you can get on young's modulus let's move on to shear modulus based questions a square slab of side 50 centimeter thickness 10 centimeter is subjected to a force of this much the lower edge is riveted on the floor how much is the upper edge displaced understand this question there is this block like this and it slides and it slides one second and it slides like this because on this particular area which is the upper face which is the upper face you have applied a force of how much this much 9 into 10 to the power 4 9 into 10 to the power 4 newton the bottom part is riveted that means you have held it properly rigidly so this can't move this can't move so the bottom surface is fixed properly there is rigid support so only the upper part has moved by some amount x that is the question how much will the upper edge how much will the upper edge be displaced by that is what has been asked what is the value of x do i know the surface area i think i know the surface area it is not that difficult because the square lead slab of 50 centimeter this is square lead slab 50 centimeter that means 50 into 50 centimeter square so this will be nothing but 25 5 5 25 two more zeros and 10 to the power minus 4 will make it meter square so this is 25 this is 25 into 10 to the power minus 2 meter square that is the area also i know one more thing and that is what is the height of this the thickness of this which is 10 centimeter which means 0.1 meter this is 0.1 meter now just use your shear modulus formula what is the formula shear modulus is shear stress shear stress upon shear strain upon shear strain is the value of g given is the value of g given i think uh, it should be given somewhere maybe in the thing uh, it is given somewhere i think it is lead is given so the value of shear modulus for lead is 5.6 into 10 to the power 9 5.6 into 10 to the power 9 so we'll have to use that 5.6 into 10 to the power 9 in ncrt there is a table of shear modulus for lead you see what is the value given it should be 5.6 into 10 to the power 9 that is what the value should be the shear stress i can just write it as what is the shear stress going to be 9 into 10 to the power how much it is 4 divided by area divided by area which is 25 into 10 to the power minus 2 whole thing divided by shear strain is the displacement x divided by the height that means divided by 0.1 everything you know in this equation all you need to do is find the value of x that's it so solving this you get it as 0.16 millimeters you will get it as 0.16 into 10 to the power minus 3 meters which is 0.16 millimeters is that understood how to solve this shear modulus problem you will be given the force you will be given the displacement you will be asked 
what is the shear modulus if shear modulus is given they will uh, give you the force and they'll ask you how much it has moved sometimes they might give you how much it has moved what is the shear modulus how much is the force all varieties of questions can come if you are worried sir sh shall i by heart this value no in ncrt they take the value from the table that is why we have to look at the table but in the exam there is no table given instead what they will give you in the question only the rigidity modulus of lead is 5.6 10 to the power 9 that is how they will give the data is that okay yes yes see correct when in parallel what will happen pavish what do you mean by when in parallel in fact the forces are parallel only that is the reason why they are displacing parallel the surfaces are moving parallel to each other if the force was perpendicular it will elongate then i will not count shear it will be longitudinal deformation when the force is perpendicular to the area it's longitudinal when it is parallel sliding bending motion it is shear is that okay understood oh clear oh can we move ahead very good very good let's move on to the next questions coming up on your screen and that is on bulk modulus average depth of indian ocean is 3000 meters calculate the fractional compression of water at the bottom of the ocean given that bulk modulus of water is 2.2 into 10 to the power 9 take g as 10 take g as 10 okay let's try to find this out see the average depth is given fractional compression is asked delta v by delta delta v by v change in volume by original volume means strain is asked it's a question related to bulk modulus bulk modulus is also given okay let's try to use the formula for bulk modulus first the bulk modulus formula is the change of the pressure upon the strain which is produced so if you don't like this no issues i can write it as bulk stress by bulk strain bulk stress by bulk strain so what is the bulk stress it is the change of the pressure what is the bulk strain it is the change in volume upon the original volume that is your bulk modulus so what is the delta v by v bring this on the top b goes below so it will be delta p by b it will be delta p by b so you just have to substitute the values that's all which is there now delta p remember you can write it as you can write it as using the knowledge of fluid statics when you go inside the ocean inside the liquid the pressure increases and if you go down by h in a liquid of density rho due to gravity then the pressure difference is rho gh p naught is external outside atmospheric pressure plus rho gh will come so the change in the pressure is basically rho gh rho g h so you just have to substitute all the values rho is basically 10 to the power 3 gravitational acceleration is 10 height which is 3000 whole thing divided by the bulk modulus which is 2.2 into 10 to the power 9 solving this you will get the answer it's exactly the same thing what they have done okay rho g h is the pressure difference and you substitute everything you will get it as 1.36 into 10 to the power minus 2 you will get this as 1.36 into 10 to the power minus 2 if they ask you percentage change in the volume then you multiply 1.36 10 to the power minus 2 into 100 and then you will get this as 1.36 percent so that is how much the volume changes 3000 that is 3 kilometers below the sea level that's negligible change you have to go three kilometers below going down three kilometers is a task in the ocean remember that and after going that deep the change in the volume is hardly 1.36 percent not much yeah so uh, madhubita remember if you are present in my fluid statics class if you are present in my fluid statics class you would remember this concept that at the sea level at the sea level the pressure which is present the pressure which is present is p naught and as you go deep inside as you go deep inside at height or depth h the pressure over here is p naught plus rho g h so if you ask me what is the change of the pressure from here till here 
the change has come because of this so that is why delta p is a rho g h is that okay density into gravity into depth that is the reason for it is that very very clear glad krishna you are seeing it step by step and you are enjoying it sir rho is the density of water yes 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 rho is the density of water only in because it is assumed to be ocean so this is the density of the liquid this is the density of liquid and in the fluid statics chapter which i just did last week i had clearly mentioned the density of water is 1 gram per cc or you can approximately take it as 10 to the power 3 kg per meter cube this is a value which you should remember don't say will this be given no this will not be given you have to remember this value like g value also usually they don't give so it is assumed to be 10 9.8 approximately and you get the closest answer so that's how you do this is that okay everybody okay a rubber ball is taken 1 km inside water so the volume reduces by this much what is the bulk modulus see they twisted the question bulk modulus is given change in volume is given relative what is the bulk modulus sorry bulk modulus is not given they are asking the bulk modulus uh, and the depth is given so again use the same concept just like we used before bulk modulus is bulk stress bulk stress by the relative change in the volume bulk stress is change in the pressure upon relative change in the volume change in the pressure is going to be rho g h upon relative change in the volume so from this the bulk modulus will be rho g h rho inside water this is water so density of water is 10 to the power 3 gravitational acceleration 10 h 1 km that means 10 to the power 3 meters this is 10 to the power 3 meters because this is water this is 10 to the power 3 kg per meter cube okay the whole thing divided by relative change in volume now because it is given 0.05% remember this is percent convert it into relative so 0.05 divided by 100 which is 5 into 10 to the power minus 4 two decimals from bottom two decimals from the top so that is why i will put 5 into 10 to the power minus 4 over here and you will get the answer what is it that you are getting 1 by 5 is 2 come on do the math quickly and think and tell me what is the answer that you are getting my dear warriors 2 into 10 to the power just check it out is it coming out 2 into 10 to the power 10 2 to 10 to the power 10 newton per meter square yes very good if you guys got it If you guys got it 2 into 10 to the power 10 c for captain strius hello me nice to see new names out here very good to see new students new students coming up for the challenge for the final over this is the final phase of the beginning of our you know channel we started we restarted i would say we came back we did everything for you right from december mid somewhere and we are reaching march right mid almost in this 3 months we have also helped you with your board examinations and we have done lots and lots of ncert problems as well especially 12th standard and yes whatever remaining 11th standard chapters are there we will try to cover up as much as possible as soon as possible right so in the next one two weeks you are seeing the entire final over is going to be concluded Yep, very good. Two into ten to power ten, very nice. Moving on, moving on, moving on. This was a neat twenty seventeen question. Bulk modulus is given B. It is given some pressure P. Fractional change in the radius is asked. Very interesting question, which was asked in neat twenty seventeen. We know that the bulk modulus is the bulk stress divided by the bulk strain divided by the bulk strain. so the bulk modulus is bulk stress bulk stress is the change in the pressure it is given pressure p so earlier there was no pressure it subjected to the new pressure so that bulk stress is p the bulk strain is basically change in volume by original volume so therefore from this delta v by v is p by b what to do now the question only says something else it is asking you what is the change fractional change in the radius fractional change in the radius we all know volume 
is 4 by 3 pi r cube. 4 by 3 pi is a constant. Use the knowledge of units, dimensions and errors. Remember relative error in a physical quantity is the power times the relative error of that other quantity and you sum them up. So when you try to find a delta v by v, this constant won't matter. The power of r is basically 3. So into delta r by r. Great. Delta v by v, delta v, delta v by v is basically from this side. It is pressure by your bulk modulus. So that's it. That is going to give me a, give, give me the answer away. So delta r by r, delta r by r, put that 3 below is p by 3 times of b. p by 3b, that should be the answer, my dear warriors. Yes, which is option d. Thank you, need aspirant. Yep. Thank you for that energy. p by 3b is the correct answer. Understood, clear. Shall we go ahead? So now are you getting that confidence not only about NCRT questions, but also for the need questions. You will be able to solve the need questions also. And yes, there will be lots and lots of neat practice which is going to go on on this chapter uh, this uh, channel remember as soon as we are done we are going to come up with some amazing content for all of you for the final run that last one and a half month before your neat 2024 examination which is there on may 5th right let's go ahead with the next concept of elastic potential energy in the stretched wire see i will say this if I have a rod and I stretch it and release it, it comes back. In fact, if I compress that rod and release it, it again comes back. So if there is some extension x or if there is a compression x, doesn't matter. There is something like a restoring force, restoring force inside the rod. And that equals the external force which has been applied on it. Same way, if I try to push the rod like this, a restoring force tries to push it back. So there is a restoring force which tries to bring it back to its natural position. This is its natural, natural position. This is elongated, this is compressed. This behavior is very much similar to that of a spring. If you take a spring at its natural length and then you basically stretch the spring by some amount x or you basically compress the spring by some amount x then there is a force which tries to pull it back or a force which you are applying from outside a force which tries to compress it a force which tries to restore it which i can call it f here that force magnitude is given by k into x. This force magnitude is given by k into x. This is for a spring. This is for a spring. Same way, this one, which is nothing but an elastic body. This is an elastic body. I feel the force is also proportional to x. How do I know that for sure? Well, we can prove it very easily. Remember, Young's modulus was stress by strain. Stress is force by the area on which it is applied. Strain is the change in length upon original length. So let's rearrange this. L goes on the top. X is below. A comes below. Now rearrange this. Send these three people, L, X and A, to the other side. So you will get this as Y, X, A divided by L is equal to F. So finally, what do you get? Finally, what do you get? Is force is equal to Y A by L. Y A by L. Check this out. Y A by L and X is also there on the top. Isn't force again proportional to X just like the spring force? Yes. So the forces inside a rod are like the spring forces like the spring forces when you elongate it the force will try to bring it back and it is also proportional to the deformation produced that is the reason why we can also say even this number over here and this number over here are equivalent to each other so the equivalent 
इक्विवेलेंट स्प्रिंग कांस्टेंट इक्विवेलेंट स्प्रिंग कांस्टेंट ऑफ एन इलास्टिक बॉडी ऑफ अ इलास्टिक बॉडी इज गिवन बाय वाई ए डिवाइडेड बाय एल दिस इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट द इक्वेलेंट स्प्रिंग कांस्टेंट इज गिवन बाय वाई ए बाय एल इज दैट वेरी वेरी क्लियर एवरीबडी विद मी एवरीबडी विद मी ऑन दिस परफेक्ट ओके ग्रेट पविश कैन यू वॉच द रिप्ले ऑफ द प्रीवियस पार्ट अगेन आई थिंक यू वुड मिस द एरर्स कॉन्सेप्ट वेर यू नो फिजिकल क्वांटिटी पी इज सम कॉन्स्टेंट इन टू पी वन रेस टू अल्फा पी टू रेस टू बीटा देन डेल्टा पी बाई पी इज अल्फा डेल्टा पी वन बाई पी वन प्लस बीटा डेल्टा पी टू बाई पी टू हैव यू मिस दैट एरर्स क्लास प्लीज वॉच दैट एरर्स क्लास दैट विल हेल्प यू Units, dimensions, errors. I have completed that on this channel. Just check that out. From that, you will understand how Schleser thought about volume is four by three pi r cube and delta v by v is, you know, three times delta r by r. Okay, that concept is there in units, dimensions, and errors. Okay, great, great. All right. Now, why did I teach you this? If a spring stores elastic potential energy. Why won't this rod, elastic body, also store elast elastic potential energy? It will definitely store it. So that is why I will say that just like a spring, just like a spring, just like a spring, the elastic body, the elastic body, which is deformed, which is deformed stores stores elastic potential elastic potential energy it stores elastic potential energy how much is that energy we know energy of a spring is half k x square but i don't have to worry about k i know the equivalent spring constant what is that equivalent spring constant it is y a by l so instead of k why not put y a by l and then just put over here x square that's it that is the elastic potential energy which is stored half k x square k is nothing but y a by l y is the young's modulus a is the area of the rod l is the length of the rod that's all but the best part is you can rewrite this formula in some other way also and it is also very useful to write it in that particular other way what is that other way that i am talking about well let's have a look see this particular potential energy which is half k uh, x square which is half y a by l into x square what i will do is probably write it down like this half right i will put y over here right and uh, let me put uh, l over here also on on the top yeah so a into l and then x square and then i will write it down like this l into l i just multiplied and divided it by l that's all i have done till now nothing great so the potential energy will be half y this a into l i will bring it down over here a into l i will bring it down over here L into L is x L is square, so I'll just write it as x by L whole square. There is no difference at all. I just shifted A L below. Half is there, Y is there, x square by L square is also there. What is A L? What is area of cross section into length? It is nothing but the volume. So this is nothing but the volume is equal to half Young's modulus. What is this quantity? What is this quantity x by l? Change upon original. That is nothing but strain. That is nothing but strain. Perfect. One small change now. We all know Young's modulus. Young's modulus is stress by strain. Stress by strain. So instead of Young's modulus, let me put stress by strain over here. Let me put stress by strain over here. This is as it is. What will happen? This will become half strain. Strain cancelled. stress into strain half stress into strain what is this energy per unit volume this is density but of energy so this is elastic 
elastic potential energy density density can be of many types density of mass density of energy the density of some other quantity but here we are talking about the elastic energy density how much joules of energy is stored per small unit volumes of that solid elastic energy density is half stress into strain another beautiful important formula the unit of this the unit of this is obviously going to be joules per meter cube joules per meter cube half stress into strain is that absolutely clear my dear warriors yep very good krishna shiva prasad excellent excellent and by the way let me also tell you uh, for you guys to join in the offline center if you want to register yourself there is a form link which is also shared in the chat as well as in the description box use that link to freely register for all the workshops which are being conducted free of cost at the offline centers it's there in multiple cities you can choose your city visit the center at this point of time you will definitely have a wonderful feeling because i have been conducting many lectures in our offline centers and slowly i will be visiting many of the cities too so make sure you are registering for the same using the link which is there in the description box below right all right so that was your elastic potential energy now can we use this elastic potential energy somewhere yes you can use it in many many different places many many different places like for example how many of you have played with a slingshot it looks something like this it looks something like this where you take a rubber band like this where you take a rubber band like this you have a stone or something of that sort over here you have a stone or something of that sort over here right and you stretch it you stretch the rubber band this is being pulled you pull it what happens is in this particular rubber band there is elastic elastic potential energy which is stored this particular stone this particular stone or this particular object slingshot has certain mass has certain mass so when you pull it and release it what will happen this mass this mass within no time will get a lot of velocity that means it will get kinetic energy this will be the kinetic energy of that body which has been thrown where will this kinetic energy come from obviously that kinetic energy has come from this elastic potential energy this got converted into this isn't that right everybody with me very good similarly similarly my dear warriors if you take the example of your uh, let's say there is a nice rubber sheet there is a nice rubber sheet this is your rubber sheet or rubber pad this is a rubber pad imagine imagine that there is a big motor or you know some gadget or some device this device is vibrating this device is basically vibrating in nature it has lot of energy dug 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 it is making noise it is shaking dug 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 what will happen those vibrational energies will get transferred into the rubber band the rubber pad will store it in the elastic form it will store it in the elastic form it will absorb the shock the rubber pad what will it do it will absorb it will absorb the shocks it will absorb the shocks this is another application of how energy gets transferred from one place to the other correct so there are many many applications of elastic potential energy even bow and arrow is an example or you take the example of uh, even i uh, say uh, how earthquakes happen has partially something to do with elastic energy so when um, uh, these plates which are floating on the surface of the earth they hit each other they are continuously under pressure imagine two huge massive tons and tons of sheets you know they rub against each other they are applying force the stress is going to get build up lots of energy is stored and when it slides tuck it will release all that energy which was stored and that energy 
uh, you know spreads in all the regions of the earth's surface from where the energy originated which is often called as the epicenter and that energy which is released is so massive that it can destroy buildings it can destroy bridges dams and so much more right so when these tectonic plates on the earth's surface they are moving on the earth's mantle which is the liquid liquid you know uh, or part or because it is very hot uh, very hot so they will float they will hit each other they will create a lot of stresses which gets stored as uh, elastic potential energy is that clear my dear warriors sometimes it is useful sometimes it is not that great that is why building in japan is made of elastic materials okay i had this fancy question which i wanted to always ask everyone everybody uses a phone right and the first thing when you buy a nice phone what do you do when you buy a nice phone what do you do first thing that you do is put a cover on the phone beautiful cover get those fancy covers some people will buy iron man cover some people will buy some glitter cover some people are not so fascinated by covers so they use transparent covers right so this is basically your cover this is basically your cover that is your phone my question is should the cover be hard or should it be soft all right what do you think what kind of property of material will you use for the cover should the cover be hard or should it be soft what do you think it should do come on or the casing of a phone should it be hard okay let's say i have this phone of mine i put some cover on this what do you think should it be a hard cover or should it be a soft cover what do you think thank you aesthetic study means a lot hard why should it be hard sir it is going to fall down sir by mistake then what will happen if it is not hard then the phone will break that is what our general thinking is okay the bumper of a car where everybody might have seen somebody driving a car and there is a bumper in the front and the back the front and the back bumpers are they made of soft materials or hard materials soft materials or hard materials come on my dear warriors the bumper of a car the bumper of a truck should it be hard or should it be soft the answer is it should be made hard the same answer is there for here also it's not hard it should be made soft that is something which is non intuitive reason is when it hits something there is lot of lot of kinetic energy imagine this falls imagine somebody drops it it falls as it falls what does it gain lot of kinetic energy and when it hits a surface whenever collision happens where will that kinetic energy go where will that kinetic energy go it has to go somewhere if it is hard it cannot absorb the shock so where will the energy go cover says i am hard i'm sorry i cannot deform i cannot stretch i cannot compress nothing i will not do anything it's making a sad face so the kinetic energy will be like okay i have to go somewhere it will go to the phone so if the kinetic energy goes to the phone oh my god all those parts of the phone will spread it will break into shatter into pieces if the bumper of the car is hard bumper will stay intact all the passengers inside will fly out because the kinetic energy of collision is huge it has to go somewhere where will it go bumper says i won't take it okay no problem energy conservation has to be applied physics won't say oops there are passengers inside sorry they will they will get hurt i will not apply energy conservation it will go it will get conserved and you will see yeah, the passengers will get hurt so the bumper of a car or a truck is soft the cover of a uh, phone is always made of soft material or brittle material soft and also sometimes brittle material will also do so that it can the kinetic energy what will where will it go it is absorbed absorbed by the cover by the protection and very minimal energy is transferred to the phone and very small energy is transferred to the phone 
is given to the phone thereby protecting it so this is only to protect the phone remember that is that clear very very interesting lot of people do not know this answer right moving on now to the elastic behavior of materials and this is where we come to the final part of this chapter where we study a graph of stress versus strain this is a very very interesting graph and this is used to study which material can be used at which place so what you do is basically you uh yeah you plot stress on one side maybe over here and strain on the other side so let's say this is the stress and this is the strain part this is origin we all know about hooke's law as per hooke's law what should happen stress should be proportional to strain right so let me just create a duplicate of this so as per hooke's law as per hooke's law stress is proportional to strain in fact stress by strain the ratio is the young's modulus stress by strain the ratio is young's modulus so the graph should be a straight line the graph should be a straight line in fact i would also say that if you measure the slope of this line if you measure the slope of this line it will be y axis by x axis so it will give you the young's modulus stress strain graphs slope will give you young's modulus so different materials will have different slopes material a might have like this material b might have like this so let's say this is material material 1 maybe material 2 might have a slope like this maybe material 2 has a slope like this so in this case i would definitely say young's modulus of 2 is less than young's modulus of 1 because it has lower slope value as simple as that is that right not just that you can also see one more thing if i measure the area let's say you know i end up taking the area under this graph i end up taking the area under this graph the base is going to be the strain the height is going to be the stress so if i measure the area under slope gives me modulus area under the stress versus strain graph what does it exactly give me it is half into base into height do you know what this term is come on put it up in the chat box i think you have just studied this half stress into strain what is that quantity called as what is that quantity called as i just told this to you some time back right over here right half stress into strain is the energy stored per unit volume joules per meter cube elastic energy density so this is nothing but rho elastic rho elastic which is elastic potential energy per unit volume that is your elastic potential energy density that is what the area under the stress versus strain graph gives me this is all according to our hooke's law that we have got till now right very good now what happens is hooke's law is not always valid that is the problem hooke's law is not always valid that is the problem so what happens is till a point till a point your stress and strain are proportional to each other but after that particular point which is i am going to label it as a this is called as the proportional limit proportional limit till the proportional limit you will see stress is proportional to strain so oa is basically a straight line after point a the graph might become non linear it might become non linear so there is some amount of non linearity which is present over here so till this particular point b it is elastic but it is non linear so from a to b it is non linear 
non-linear. But there is one thing which happens which is common from O to A and A to B. That is, that is, if you go from O, then to A and then to B, what is common for all of them is that it is elastic behavior. It is elastic behavior. This is very, very important. Meaning, if somebody increases the stress, strain will increase. You pull it, it will elongate. You release it, it will come back. So, if I show an arrow mark over here, if I show an arrow mark here, it will go both the ways. If I show an arrow mark over here, even though it is non-linear, it is both the ways. What is this double arrow mark representing? You can load it, you can unload it. And when you unload it, it will come back to its original shape and size. So it is behaving in an elastic manner. And it behaves in an elastic manner only till a certain stress is applied. And that is till point B. And this stress which you get over here, that is called as the yield stress. Yield stress. What is yield stress? That is the maximum stress that you can apply till which the body behaves in an elastic manner. Okay. So, as long as stress is less than or equal to the yield stress, yield stress, the body is going to behave in an elastic manner. Elastic behavior. Elastic behavior is obtained. Is this point very, very clear in your head, my dear warriors? Now what happens is, now what happens is after this particular point, so you went linearly like this till this particular point A. Then there was non-linear behavior till this particular point B. Beyond this point, it goes into the plastic zone. So it is non-linear definitely, but it is only one way. Meaning if you load it, it goes, but if you release the stress, then it will come back to some new point over here. It will come back via a different path. And you can see there is permanent deformation. It has been permanently set to a new shape or size. Reason, check this out. You have gone into the plastic zone. You have stretched it so much that it cannot come back. It's just like your relationship. You might fight with your friend a little bit. You might go apart, you will come back. You might fight again a little bit more. One day you will, you know go apart and again you will be friends again but if you fight so much you say something really bad then that's it permanent damage has been done you, even if you uh, uh, you know stop quarreling or you stop fighting that you know that uh, difference is there there is a wall between you so same way you can stress it and you release the stress it will not come back to zero it will come back to some new value of strain strain means deformation look at this there is no stress stress has gone outside forces have gone but still there is some deformation that is permanent set you can load it to some new value and it will unload back to some another value so this is plastic behavior and this happens till this particular point c so from b to c is also called as the plastic zone or plastic behavior plastic zone right and this happens till that point c that point c is called as your strength or basically the uh, you know ultimate ultimate strength ultimate strength point of the material where it breaks where it breaks after this point it will be very bad because if you check this value of the stress that you will get over here sigma break that sigma break sigma break is the stress for breaking that material stress to fracture or break that material stress to fracture or break that particular material because after that what happens is immediately the stress actually goes down instead of increasing and it breaks or it fractures over here it fractures over here and this is almost instantly almost instantly this happens from here to here 
it takes fraction of a second you load it load it load it load it load it tuck it breaks and when it breaks zoop all the stress will be going out the strain is still increasing and within no time everything has gone it breaks off so this is how the graph looks like is that okay clear everybody with me awesome awesome one more point which i would like to mention over here is that in the stress strain graph specifically if this is stress this is strain if this is stress this is strain and let's say this is your elastic zone and then this is your plastic zone okay this is your plastic zone and then you basically come back over here like this via an unloading path in this particular manner unloading path in this particular manner this area that you see this area that you see is basically the energy energy which is lost per unit volume energy which is lost per unit volume you load it you unload it in that process you will have lost some energy that energy lost per unit volume is given by the area enclosed by the stress strain graph is that absolutely clear my dear warriors shall we go to some questions now shall we go to some questions now yes very good let's go then okay let's finish this chapter the stress strain graph i have already given to you all right let's move on the slope of the stress versus strain graph of a given material is called as come on my dear warriors quickly pounce on to these answers because we have to go to viscosity right we'll try to complete viscosity in the next half hour so that we can take a break and come back to surface tension also right yes the slope of the stress strain graph is nothing but called as the modulus of elasticity young's modulus correct so that is the answer perfect you have seen that stress strain graphs are drawn for two materials x and y this was a neat 2019 question it is observed that the ultimate strength point that is the maximum stress that you can apply before it breaks gives up are close to each other for the materials but far apart for the material y we can say uh, uh, ultimate strength and the fracture point are close to each other uh, for material x and far apart for the material y we can say that the material x and y are likely to be what and what come on think about this think about this what do you think is the correct answer for this particular question so i just make you visualize what is happening over here stress stress strain strain so graph goes up like this graph goes up like this this part for material x are close to each other took and for material y is far away so what do you think will happen this is for your material x and this is for your material y if it is very quick that means it is going to break very suddenly it's like you know there is a biscuit in your hand you would try to bend it and tuck it breaks it's brittle in nature you are breaking something breaking something and you release slowly the material opens up cracks develop zwee aram se you know it breaks apart so it is like chewy gummy sticky in nature slowly it is breaking apart open so that is why the uh, separation is more so it is most likely ductile ductile and malleable are the properties of a material which makes it you know to be drawn into sheets and drawn into wires easily you can hit onto it you can hit onto it and you can bend it you can give it any shape that is uh, that is the property of gold silver that is why it is used to make jewelry because you can make it into sheets you can draw it into wires and all of that so very easily you can give it some shape by hitting onto it or bending it by applying some forces so most likely x is brittle and y is ductile understood my dear warriors this was sudden this was slow that is why i said brittle and ductile very good very good moving on to the next one coming up on your screen here it is a wire of certain length is stretched to 1 mm cross sectional area is this much energy density of the wire come on my dear warriors the energy density has been asked energy density has been asked not that difficult question not that difficult question what do you do 
energy density use the formula the energy density formula is half stress into strain do i know the stress check this out energy density is asked wire's length is given stretched is given area is given young's modulus is given so stress is not given no worries i know stress is young's modulus into strain stress is young's modulus into strain because modulus is stress by strain so stress is modulus into strain so into the strain so this will be half young's modulus into strain square therefore the energy density will be given by half young's modulus is 2 into 10 to the power 11 into strain strain is change by original change is 1 millimeter 1 millimeter is 10 to the power minus 3 original is 10 the whole things square the whole things is square come on what is it that you are going to get obviously 2 2 will get cancelled only powers of 10 are going to remain so only option possible is option c yes it is the c option 2 and 2 cancel so 10 10 10 every power of 10 is there so numbers can't be there so it has to be 10 to the power 3 joules per meter cube yes very good many of you got the correct answer proud of all of you moving on to the next one when a load of this much kg is hung from the wire extension of 2 meter is produced then the work done by the restoring force is how much a very brilliant question over here so a, a load of 10 kg is hung from the wire all right let's draw the diagram let's draw the diagra diagram a load of 10 kg a load of 10 kg is hung from the wire so question is if this much extension is produced how much is the work done by the restoring force meaning what is the energy stored what is the energy which is stored in the wire that is the question so there will be some tension there will be some weight the weight will be mg now if you want to find the energy stored in it i can use half k x square k is nothing but y a by l into x square that is one way of doing it or if you don't like this formula you can also use half stress into strain is modulus uh, sorry energy per unit volume that is also perfectly fine i have not been given the young's modulus of it no issues so what i will do young's modulus i will write it as stress by strain over here a is as it is l is as it is x square is as it is now what i will do next stress stress into area what is stress into area stress into area is basically force because stress is force by area so area into stress is force so force by this epsilon into l think about it if you don't understand it no issues we can do one more thing stress was force by area and this is area strain is change in length by original length into length and this is x square you can see many terms will get cancelled so the energy stored will be area area got cancelled ll got cancelled one of the x also got cancelled so it will be half into f into into basically x half into f into x is that right half into f in f into x now what is that force that force is basically mg and that x is the extension what is the mass 10 kg what is g 10 what is the extension 2 2 2 got cancelled 10 into 10 is basically 100 joules so 100 joules option b will be the answer it's a very brilliant question it's a very brilliant question because many people might make some silly mistake while solving it right moving on moving on to the next one coming up on your screen two wires of the same material have same volume area of a and area of other is 3a wire of cross section a is stretched by force f then the force on the other wire for the same extension is how much let's get a general formula first then we will find the ratio whenever such questions come try to find a general relation between the variables then take the division and the ratio we all know stress by strain is the young's modulus stress is force by area strain is change in length by original length that is what it is question is on the force if i am not wrong so force is y a will go on the top x will be also on the top l will be below now check this out properly 
Force is asked on the other one if the force on the first one is F. So if I divide F2 by F1, first of all, they are made of the same material. Because they are of the same material, Young's modulus is same. So Y, Y will get cancelled. So don't bother about it. Next, have the same volume. Oh, if they have the same volume and if the uh, area is different, length will also be different. Another thing, they are having the same extension. That means X is also same. So Y is same, X is same, only area and length are different. Only area and length are different. So this will be nothing but A2 by A1 and this will be L1 by L2. Is this very, very clear? It is directly proportional to area, inversely proportional to the length. Now area ratio is given, that's one thing. But length ratio is not given, that's another thing. But we can find the relation between them because it is clearly mentioned same volume. This was NEED 2018. Volume is area into length. Therefore, A1 L1 will be A2 L2. Therefore, L1 by L2, L1 by L2, won't it be A2 by A1? Won't it be A2 by A1? So this particular ratio, L1 by L2, I can put it as A2 by A1. So what will you get? You will get this as A2 by A1 whole square. The other area is 3A. The first area of cross section is A. So whole square of it. So A cancels 3 square is going to be 9. So F2, I don't know. F1, I know is F. So therefore F2 will be 9 times of F. 9 times of F, which is option D for doctor. Which is option D for doctor. You have to use every single piece of information to get relevant equations. Every word was important. That is what I want you to appreciate and understand, learn and apply. Right? Because very few people will tell you all the steps and this is what I want you to learn from me on this channel. See how I am solving. Don't get scared. Be confident. Try to solve the same questions after the class. You will get that confidence. Alright. Let's go to viscosity now. Done with, done with solids. Shall we go to viscosity? All right. Let's go to viscosity. Now, what is this viscosity? I'll talk about it. I'll give the applications. Then we'll go to two major formulas which are there in our NEET syllabus. Two major formulas are there, and or two major concepts which are there, and that is a very small part of the big chapter. See, viscosity in simple terms is nothing but fluid resistance fluid resistance and this fluid resistance to relative motion relative motion this fluid resistance comes because of two major reasons because of intermolecular forces intermolecular forces and also intermolecular collisions. If you talk about gas, intermolecular forces are less but collisions are more. So usually this theory is applicable for gas. If you talk about liquid, molecular collisions are there but the dominating effect is the intermolecular forces. Because in liquid, the forces are higher. So this is dominating theory for liquid. Did you understand? This is resistance to motion. Example, you throw water or spill water on the floor. The water will move, but it does not keep on moving forever because the fluid also has its own resistance. Or imagine there are two surfaces of solid which always rub against each other. You put some oil in between them, it becomes smooth. Have you seen that? Some uh, door hinge is there. A door hinge is there. It has become rusted. It is making some squeaky noise. You put some oil over there. It will become smooth and it can lubricate it. So that fluid is generally going to act, you know, like a lubricant between two solid surfaces. It can slide easily. But remember that fluid also has some small resistance, which is much less than your usual friction. See, what's the difference between friction and viscous force? Friction is between two solid surfaces rubbing onto each other, like my hands. 
what is there between my hands friction is there friction is there but if i put oil on my hands then the force which comes is viscous force then the force which comes is the viscous force which is basically between liquid 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 gas 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 basically some fluid that is basically viscous force which is fluid resistance to relative motion sometimes also called as the drag force as the drag force as the drag force you will see that the viscous force for liquids and gases also depends on the temperature apart from the shape and size it also depends on the temperature so you will see one very interesting thing for liquids for liquids as your temperature increases what will happen intermolecular forces will become weak because the liquid molecules will have more collision energy the forces will become less so you will see the viscous force viscous force will also become less but for gas what happens is as the temperature increases the collisions will become more higher and higher so there will be more resistance to motion so that is the reason why the viscous force the viscous force will increase the drag force will increase and this viscous force you will find in many 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 situations imagine you are riding a bike you are riding a bike this is your pandu who is riding the bike look at him is riding the bike like this he also encounters air resistance the air part of it might go uh, in the tires it might get trapped like this some of the air will go around him like this some of the air will go over him like this some of the air will go around him like this these are the streamlines of the wind which are crossing over that pandu he also will encounter definitely some resistance so that is the drag force or you can also called as the viscous force as the viscous force you might have seen that your normal trains which were built before versus now the old trains look like this whereas the new trains look something like this like the vande bharat express with minimal gap between them with minimal gap between the bogies right or there are some rubber paddings between the bogies like this why the difference why is that difference there now the reason is viscous force has a lot of role to play over here when the box like structure is there then the wind will go get trapped over here the wind will go like this will get trapped over here and these turbulent effects these turbulent effects bring in lot of air resistance so there is lot of drag force drag is higher drag is high drag is higher here but in this case you will see nice streamlines are formed nice beautiful streamlines are formed and you will see that the drag is very less over here drag is going to be very less over here it becomes very easy for it to flow understood my dear warriors right even in a river which is flowing if this is the river bed or this is the canal this is the bed of a river this is the bed of a river you will see the liquid close to the river bed is flowing very slowly the one on the top is moving little bit fast the one on the top is even faster the one on the surface is the fastest this is a fast moving layer this is a slow moving layer so between the layers also there is lubricant effect there is drag effect viscous effect and there is viscous force at play over here the solid which is in contact the river bed is trying to slow down the river on the top there is nothing to stop it so it flows very freely so as you go from the top to bottom the speed of the layers will be different is that right exactly very good very good awesomeness now that you understand what is viscous force or drag force what is this phenomena of viscosity it originates from two theories one for liquid one for gas and that's why when you change the temperature 
viscosity might increase or decrease depending on whether it is a liquid or a gas. Let's define this viscosity uh, parameter and this was given by Newton. This was given by Newton. So, the first quantity which you should know for understanding viscosity is that between different layers, there might be changes in the velocity. There is a velocity gradient which is set up, something like this. Meaning, if this has velocity v, this might have a velocity of v plus dv for, for a small difference between the layers of let's say dy. From one layer to another layer, I have gone up by dy the velocities have changed by dv. If this was v, this is v plus dv. So, you define a quantity called as the velocity gradient. This is sometimes also called as the strain velocity, strain velocity, strain velocity. This is how much is the change in the velocity upon the difference of the layers dv by dy as simple as that that is called as the velocity gradient what is it called velocity gradient rate of change of velocity with respect to the layer difference this is the first thing which you should know everybody you can write it in your running notes or if it is there in your head good and don't worry all the notes will be given to you after the class is over okay velocity gradient or strain velocity now what newton did is that he saw that if there is a velocity gradient which is set up in a liquid and let's say you have a sheet like this of some area A in this particular manner. Okay. Then this sheet will experience a drag force, a viscous force, this force of viscosity, viscous force, I can say viscous force is opposite to the motion and this viscous force was found out to be dependent on or rather proportional to the area, was found out to be proportional to the area and it was also found out to be proportional to the velocity gradient remember just in the previous slide i told you about the velocity gradient it was also found out to be proportional to the velocity gradient velocity gradient so there will be some dv by dy over here so then he gave a constant to it so the viscous force viscous force you can convert it into equality there will be a constant, there will be area over here, there will be dv by dy over here. That constant is given the symbol eta, that constant is given the symbol eta, that is called as the viscosity of the liquid or the coefficient of viscosity. That is called as the, this is called as the viscosity, viscosity of the fluid or you can also call this as the coefficient of viscosity of the fluid of the fluid this eta decides whether the fluid is viscous or less viscous more viscous etc example honey is more viscous than 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 water than water therefore the viscosity for honey the value for it will be much larger than the viscosity coefficient for water because water can flow easily but you take out sauce from a bottle or honey from the bottle will it flow easily no it will not flow easily that's why the viscosity coefficient is higher for honey and lower for water keep this in mind yep this is the formula which Newton gave, which is eta A dv by dy. You can also find the unit of eta. It is not that difficult. Like because F is eta A dv by dy. If one had to write the units of each of these terms, this is basically Newton. 
eta i don't know yet i just keep it like this area is meter square velocity is meter per second dy is just meter 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 get cancelled so from here i can just write newton is equal to this eta i don't know is meter square by second newton newton you can also write it as newton you can also write it as you know kg meter square per second kg meter square per second you can see meter square meter square second second will uh one second did we do it right meters per second or meter area is meter square newton is kg meter oh sorry <laughs> my bad this was kg meter per second square kg meter per second square yes one meter one meter will cancel one second one second will cancel so it will become kg per second is equal to the viscosity units the meter will remain one of the second has got cancelled so the unit of eta will be kg per meter second kg per meter second that will be the unit that will be the unit of eta is that clear my dear warriors in si system in cgs system it will be gram per centimeter second gram per centimeter second otherwise it will be kg per meter second that is how you can get the unit of viscosity this is unit of eta in si system in case of cgs in cgs system the unit of eta will be gram per uh, centimeter second by the way this gram per centimeter second is also called as poise is also called as poise cgs unit just like force has a unit of newton in si for uh, viscosity in cgs it is called as a poise so one poise is one gram per centimeter second you can easily convert from that to this by putting the relevant data clear till this point very nice very nice let's go to some questions then if there were no gravity which of the following will not be there for a fluid imagine gravity is only not there you go to space earth's gravitational pull is not there surface tension i know i have not taught you but still i think you can answer viscosity surface tension pressure archimedes upward thrust when you are in space inside a spacecraft can you experience pressure yes you can experience pressure obviously they are breathing in air out inside a spacecraft so there is pressure surface tension yes you will see that surface tension is a intermolecular force which is present on the surface of a liquid that also is not dependent on gravity viscosity viscosity is also due to thermal collisions or intermolecular forces that won't disappear because gravity is not there so that will be also present archimedes principle the upthrust force buoyant force has a formula v rho g rho is the density of fluid v is volume submerged into g g is only not there gone thrust force buoyant force will also disappear so it is the archimedes upward force or the buoyant force which goes off yeah so viscosity will be present the question was which will not be present read the question very very carefully read the question very very carefully got it till this point all right moving on to the next one a metal block of certain area is connected to this mass this is ncert exercise passing over a ideal pulley consider massless and frictionless liquid with a film of thickness is placed between the block and the thing when release block moves to the right with a constant speed find the coefficient of viscosity so let's understand you can see there is a film which is there on the table surface and on that film a block is sliding the rope is connected to this mass this mass is applying uh, a force on the string because of its weight and the block gets pulled but the block is not accelerating in fact the block is moving with a constant speed reason being there is viscous force so if you look at it little bit more carefully you will realize that this is the block okay this is that particular block and you have this film which is like this which is having some velocity profile it's a very thin film something like this it's all on the table it's all on the table and this block is moving with some velocity v is moving with some velocity v this is how 
it looks like this film has a thickness this is your film thickness this is your film thickness clearly there is a velocity gradient clearly there is some area of contact and clearly there will be some viscous force clearly there will be some viscous force which will be opposing it and this viscous force is given by newton's formula which is eta a dv by dy eta i think i know area also i think we can find out i think thickness is also given area is also given everything is given perfect and what is this force going to be this force will be balanced by the tension force and what will this tension be equal to what will this tension be equal to this tension will be equal to this tension and this tension will be equal to this weight so basically the drag force will be the tension which is the weight which is mg so mass is 0 0.01 g is basically 10 so 0 0.1 newton so 0 0.1 newton is the drag force which is experienced remember acceleration is not there that is why the forces are balanced so just put the force as 0.1 over here the coefficient of viscosity we have to find then uh, i don't know that the area of cross section area of cross section is 0.1 meter square so this is 0.1 the velocity between this and this the difference of it understand this layer this layer which is in contact with the solid is moving with 0.085 this is moving with 0.085 eight five meters per second this point is basically at rest so what is the difference obviously it is 0 0.085 but for a difference of how much the film thickness which is 0 0.3 millimeters it is given right over there 0 0.3 millimeters so 0 0.3 into 10 to the power minus 3 meters so that is your velocity gradient solving this solving this you are going to get you are going to get your viscosity coefficient eta it comes out 3.5 into 10 to the power minus 3 3.5 into 10 to the power minus 3 is that right everybody with me yes very good very good Lakshmi Suresh this session might continue till 3 3 30 also yep awesome now there is one more thing which I need to tell you and this is with regards to the flow with regards to the streamline with regards to the flow or with, with regards to the streamline this part might also be there in hydrodynamics but i would love to take it here because we had done hydrodynamics last time and it is dependent on this chapter of viscosity see last lecture i mean in the last class which was about fluid dynamics i told you there is one flow which is very predictable where the streamlines are consistent so consistent streamlines consistent streamlines are there no matter how, what time you see it streamlines look the same that is called as a steady flow this is called as a steady flow this is basically called as your steady flow then sometimes the streamlines look like this then after some time if you see the streamlines might look like this right and after some more time maybe the streamlines look like this right the, from the same points they are originating but with different instants they are changing so basically streamlines streamlines are randomly changing are randomly changing such a kind of a flow was called as a turbulent flow turbulent flow where it is not consistent i had explained this to you even in hydrodynamics there is a parameter which tells you whether the flow is streamlined which is predictable or it is unpredictable meaning it is turbulent in nature and that parameter is called as reynolds number where if you have a pipe if you have a pipe of certain area of cross section and you see that there is some liquid flowing in it there is some liquid which is flowing in it with some velocity v with some velocity v then if you divide 
uh, by the way the density of the liquid is rho if you divide this particular numbers density into velocity a uh, rho v into area is also there i think instead of area let me put diameter that will be better this is the diameter of the pipe rho v into the diameter of the pipe by eta eta is the viscosity coefficient this ratio is called as the reynolds number re this is called as your reynolds number it's a magical number which can predict this magical number can predict the flow can predict the flow can predict the flow meaning what i tell you rho vd density into speed into diameter by eta for a pipe if i find this number if i find this reynolds number to be less than 1000 reynolds number less than 1000 then then the flow is most likely going to be steady you will see proper nice beautiful streamlines if you see this reynolds number more than 2000 that means the flow is going to be turbulent in nature it is highly unpredictable so you will try to maintain the reynolds number less than 1000 if it is more than 2000 100% it is going to be turbulent in nature so how do you calculate that number density speed and diameter and eta will be given from that you can get that number yeah somebody will be thinking sir what will it be if it is between 1000 and 2000 then the flow can be sometimes steady can be sometimes unsteady so there you cannot precisely say whether it is surely uh, uh, turbulent or surely steady so if it is in between of that if it is in between of that please keep that in mind if it is reynolds number is between you know 1000 and 2000 it is said to be unsteady in nature unsteady that means it is uh, going to be turbulent sometimes turbulent sometimes and also steady sometimes it is going to switch between these two it is sometimes going to be turbulent sometimes going to be steady it will keep switching it is not always turbulent turbulent means it is random every time zoop 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 water molecules are going everywhere yeah is that clear my dear students shall we go to the final concept then yep cool so this was done stokes law perfect this was supposed to be here now different shapes different sizes will experience different drag force like say for example if i take this sphere and make it move versus a square and make it move versus some tapered object like this and make it move each one of them will have different types of streamlines going around them like this is that right each one of them will have different streamlines this will be like the craziest of all like this this will have some crazy behavior right because it's a square sharp edges are there here it will be very smooth like this very smooth yeah because it is like tapered in nature very smooth maybe maybe this will experience the largest drag force the drag force will be very large here the drag force will be medium not so much maybe in this the drag force is the least because it is tapered in nature so the drag force the drag or the viscous force viscous force depends depends on many things one of them is the shape other thing is the size other thing is the fluid in which it is moving it also depends on the speed of motion it also depends on the speed of motion and you would have experienced this when you are sitting on a bike imagine you are sitting on a bike you are wearing some jacket and you remove the jacket like this you will feel that the wind is trying to push you away so the size matters the same person same object size has changed the drag force will change 
you increase the speed you will see that the drag force will also increase you're driving you increase the speed zoom 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 you will see a lot of air will hit on you and the drag force will increase so it depends on the speed fluid also matters usually you will drive in air only but yeah if the quality of the air is different or uh, like think of it this way you are walking normally you can walk easily but if you have to walk in water it's so difficult why the fluid gives you a lot of resistance so it also depends on the fluid shape also matters meaning if there is a fish it can swim easily you are not used to live in aquatic marine life so that's why you find it difficult so the shape also matters that's why the fishes have a beautifully tapered body so that they can easily swim with a very less drag force very less the drag force otherwise the fish will waste a lot of its energy in just swimming across it right okay so stokes law is only used for circular objects keep this in mind so if you have a circular object moving with certain speed v and then there are streamlines which are going like this around it then the drag force the drag force which it experiences was calculated by stoke using complex mathematics your derivation is not there for that the drag force comes out to be 6 number 6 pi which is your 3.14 into eta which is coefficient of viscosity radius that will decide the uh, size into velocity 6 pi eta rv 6 pi eta rv is the drag force which it will experience also keep in mind drag forces like this are non-conservative non-conservative force non-conservative force that means it is going to cause a loss of energy it is not like gravity or spring which stores the energy it will lose the energy the energy this force does work against the motion against the motion and loses loses its energy loses its energy as heat sound etc heat sound etc so when you move some objects you will hear some good 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 sound like something is moving you hear that machine sound so that sound is basically coming because the viscous force is sucking away all that energy so some heat is developed some sound is developed some light might be developed it loses its energy to the surroundings it's a non-conservative force formula is 6 pi eta rv only for spheres please bear that in mind only only for spheres you cannot use this obviously for square because square won't have radius so like i said it depends on size it depends on shape fluid and speed everything is there it depends on the size speed fluid and the shape yes because this constant will be different for different geometry for square it could be different for triangle it will be different for circular objects it is six pi everything has been put up in the formula yes is that clear the derivation which you have in 11 now that is a fraud derivation in ncrt why is it a fraud derivation because what they do is they derive it using dimensional analysis i know dimensional analysis is a good method also it is not illegal but it is not convincing i mean i wouldn't believe something just because it is dimensionally correct i can write anything dimensionally so the actual derivation is much more complicated they made it very simple using dimensional analysis so that's what they do in 11th ncrt okay so that's why i call it sometimes as a fraud derivation although it, nothing is uh, wrong about it i won't be convinced i won't be getting that surety i won't be getting that guarantee that's all now using stokes law you get a very important formula for something called as the terminal velocity now imagine the clouds with raindrops right you might have seen after a point of time if it's after a point of time if the speed of the raindrop is increasing it just doesn't keep on increasing in fact 
after a point of time the velocity becomes constant here in this part the velocity is increasing velocity is increasing but after some time the velocity is almost roughly a constant why would this happen why does it stop accelerating why is the velocity constant that means it stops accelerating why does it stop accelerating the only reason for it to stop accelerating is the viscous force viscous force drag force is dependent on the speed the more you increase the speed drag will oppose it after a point when you increase the speed the drag force has also increased so much that you will not be able to accelerate any further that is why it comes down with a constant speed just imagine if drag force was not present if drag is absent if drag is absent then the speed will be given by root of 2 gh imagine the cloud is at a height of just half a kilometer which is a very normal height half a kilometer is basically 500 meters 2 into 10 or rather 2 into 500 is 1000 1000 into 10 is basically 10000 this will make it 100 meters per second it will smash your head smash you because it is a large speed guys 100 meters per second can you believe it 100 meters in 1 second that much high speed water is coming on your face on your head you will get crushed you can't live thankfully thankfully we have viscous force which prevents stops accelerating and this stops accelerating due to viscous force of air viscous force provided by the air very very crucial is that very clear this velocity which is constant this is called as the terminal velocity terminal velocity or terminal speed terminal velocity is this concept clear why terminal velocity comes why terminal velocity comes is this concept clear who is responsible and what would happen if drag force was absent you would get killed you would get smashed so how much is the drag force that derivation we can do it very easily imagine you take a drop this is a drop of that rain that drop will experience multiple forces on it one is its own weight one is its own weight by the way the drop was coming down with certain speed v i just show it as v the own weight will be there second force which will be there is the buoyant force acting on it buoyant force of air so i'll put fb over here i'll put f b over here buoyant force and because it is coming down air resistance force will be upwards so the drag force so the drag force will be over here the drag force will be here and because it has reached its terminal velocity vt because it might have reached its terminal velocity let's say vt therefore the acceleration of such a drop will be zero because vt is constant speed so no acceleration further constant speed it is coming down so all the forces must be balanced all the forces must be balanced that's what i will say so since acceleration is zero net force on it is zero so all the forces will be balanced like weight will be equal to the buoyant force plus your drag force plus your drag force so first of all weight weight is mg weight is nothing but mg but i don't like mg i want to write it in terms of density and volume and all of that mass is density into volume and into g what is density density uh, i don't know uh, one second i'll use different symbol for it density i'll use sigma into volume into g well density i will put it as sigma volume can i just write it as 4 by 3 pi r cube 4 by 3 pi r cube and this will become g so 4 by 3 pi r cube is volume sigma is the density of the drop g is gravity so understand over here sigma is the density of the solid 
density of the solid keep this in mind this drop will also have some radius which is r next thing what about buoyant force buoyant force is volume into density of fluid into g okay so i think i know what is the volume it is 4 by 3 it is 4 by 3 pi r cube density of fluid is rho into g rho is the density of fluid outside density of the fluid outside that drop outside that drop lastly i have to take the drag force drag force is 6 pi eta rv so just put it as it is 6 pi eta r into v this is according to stokes law this is from stokes law this is just from purely stokes law nothing else you will see many things will get cancelled over here many things are going to just get cancelled let me tell you that my dear warriors like this pi over here this pi over here this pi over here this r will cancel this will become 2 this will become 2 right you will also see 6 will get cancelled over here will become 3 4 will get cancelled will become 2 4 will get cancelled will become 2 rearrange everything rearrange everything to find out your terminal velocity rearrange everything to find out how much is your terminal velocity it comes out as 2 by 9 2 by 9 because this 3 into 3 becomes 9 there will be 2 here and then you will have uh, what do you say g over here then you also have r square over here then you have sigma minus rho over here and uh, what else is there what else is there eta yes eta will be over here 9 eta 9 eta will come over here correct perfect this is the final answer for the terminal velocity for the terminal velocity you should remember it you should remember it sigma is the density of the ball the drop object rho is the density of the fluid outside g is acceleration r is the radius of the ball eta is the viscosity coefficient 2 by 9 is the number which you get so terminal speed is 2 by 9 g r square sigma minus rho by eta remember this write it 5 6 times 10 times 20 times 100 times till you remember it yep yes i know in waves also they have used dimension analysis that is completely you know <laughs> joke method it is lol method all right it is okay I mean for NCRT because the actual derivation is much much more complex that's why so we'll excuse them we will we'll tell them you are forgiven no problems okay so all these formulas done let's do some questions based out of this the velocity of a ball of mass m and density rho when dropped in a container filled with glycerin of density rho by 2 becomes constant after some time the viscous force acting on the ball in the final stage this is uh, easy if you know the derivation because the velocity becomes constant after some time that means terminal con velocity uh, concept is used here so this ball this ball which is coming down with vt with acceleration as zero experiences multiple forces on it one is its own weight one is its own weight second is the buoyant force and the last one is the drag force fd as per this diagram the drag force plus the buoyant force is the weight so the drag force will be the weight minus the buoyant force what is the weight what is the weight well the velocity of the ball of mass m everything in terms of m so i'll just put it as mg i'll just put it as mg because the mass is m g is g only buoyant force is v into density of the fluid the density of the fluid is rho by 2 so v rho by 2 into g but wait a minute this v into rho volume into the density of the ball is actually the mass so it will be m by 2 into g everybody agrees with this part check this out ball's mass is given density is given so won't rho be mass by volume so volume into density will become mass volume into density will become mass so mg minus mg by 2 how much will it be mg by 2 so that is the answer mg by 2 which is option number c c for captain shreyas that was asked in 2021 paper my dear students such a straightforward question 
let's move ahead to the next one coming up on your screen the viscous force acting on a metal sphere of diameter this much falling through this much viscosity liquid with a speed of 2 meters per second is how much the viscous drag is being asked on a liquid all right everything is given this is eta this is speed diameter is given that means radius is 0 0.5 millimeter which is 5 into 10 to the power minus 4 meters radius is also given viscosity is given question is drag force is asked the drag force is 6 pi eta r v that's all 6 into 3.14 into eta which is 0 0.8 everything is si units radius 5 into 10 to the power minus 4 into speed which is 2 imagine this question came in need 2023 most of you if you are a dropper might already remember this question it was that straightforward and what is the answer for this comes out to be 1.5 into 10 to the power minus 3 just check this out close to this option number a just do the math you'll get the answer yes uh yep correct 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 very good shall we go ahead shall we go ahead yes moving on to the next one terminal speed of a copper ball of radius falling in a tank is this much find the eta value if the density is this much density is this much what is the use of this temperature nothing chumma they have given to waste your time to confuse you in exercise 9.9 .9. you just have to use this formula terminal speed is 2 by 9 here you have eta here you have r square g and here you have sigma minus rho so basically eta will be 2 r square g sigma minus rho whole thing 9 is there eta has been shifted on the top terminal speed is there below over here you just have to substitute every value 2 is 2 r radius is 2 millimeters so 2 into 10 to the power minus 2 square then gravity is 10 difference of the density difference of the density so 8.9 8.9 minus 1.5 the whole thing into 10 to the power 3 whole thing divided by 9 eta uh, sorry 9 into vt terminal speed is 6.5 centimeters per second so 6.5 into 10 to the power minus 2 meters per second solve this you'll get the answer it is that straight forward is that okay my dear warriors yes when you solve it you will get it as 9.9 .9 into 10 to the power minus 1 or basically you will get it approximately as 0 0.99 that is the value of eta that you get after solving it these are all straightforward questions this question i want you to solve it as homework maybe right now because now is the time for break the answer is there on the next slide which i'm not going to show you but it's time for a break if you want just take a screenshot of this question just take a screenshot of this question this is your homework okay before we go to the break just take a screenshot of this question it is a previous year question try to solve it and then go for your lunch and return back when are we going to return back uh, well let's see the time is uh, almost two o'clock how about uh, returning at 220 or something or 215 close to that yeah 220 will return right see you don't go anywhere smash the like button if you have not done that already yeah please do that and subscribe to the channel we'll be back what are we going to do after the session we are going to do surface tension pressure in drops pressure in liquids capillary rise and fall angle of contact cohesion addition forces all these things we are going to complete okay chal see you after some time
Yo, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I hope you had your amazing lunch and back with full josh and energy. Let's be back or tell me if I should cancel the class. Have you messaged all your friends to be back? Or you're going to uh, skip surface tension? Should I stop? Should I continue? You guys are back. Audible, visible. Hello, Krishna. Welcome back. Yes. All the warrior pandus. Come on, come on, come on. Show some josh. Show some energy in the chat box. I know these are all long classes, but you know, that is the whole plan. Now, what is the next plan after this? I mean, we'll just complete surface tension. I'm thinking in this week, let's complete heat transfer. Uh, let's also complete uh, motion in 2D and vectors as much as possible. So these two things we'll try to complete uh, this week itself. And if possible, yes, uh, EM waves, uh, if time permits, but if not, we'll take it to next week and uh, we'll also uh, cover up uh, wave optics in the next uh, week okay so that is the plan and then i think most of the chapters are over uh, hardly some small small things like work power energy and all those are basic things uh, we have been doing it otherwise also and if you have been a part of those marathons which i conducted during the uh, physics board exam you would see that most of the 12th standard ncrt was covered uh, be it question solving be it uh, your theory part uh, be it your uh, derivations, most of it was covered. So I think we will have some practice sessions as well for 12th standard syllabus. But yeah, uh, re optics, modern physics, logic gates, all these are covered already. EMI, all these things. So whatever small, small things here and there are there, we'll just try to finish it off in the next one, two weeks. Okay. So gear up with full energy, full josh, because not much of time is left and we need to finish as much as possible in the next one two weeks right cool let's begin let's begin let's begin with surface tension concept and what is this surface tension well i'll explain this to you with a small story then you'll understand it but the basic definition says that surface tension is a property is a property of the free surface of a liquid it is a property of a free surface of a liquid to act like a stretched stretch means you are pulling it stretched membrane membrane means sheet stretched membrane membrane and basically it uh, it acts like a stretched sheet of a membrane and behaves behaves as if it's under tension it's under tension and tries to and tries to contract and tries to contract this is basically called as surface tension and this property depends on two things depends on number one the fluid itself or basically the liquid itself which liquid you are using are you using alcohol water some juice it also depends on the temperature on the temperature and if you have mixed something in the liquid that also matters meaning you have adulterated it it is contaminated so basically the liquid properties and the temperature decides how strong is the tendency to contract now why does this come let's have a look so that's where the story comes into play now imagine if there is one pandu over here and another pandu over here and they make a bond between them that means there is a strong friendship bond between them they will be very very happy imagine this pandu also makes a friendship bond with another pandu over here they will be even more happy more the friends the merrier it is this pandu makes a friend another place with another pandu he will be even more happy and then another pandu becomes his friend he will be even more happy but you can't make friendship with everyone because there is a limited amount of time that you can spend with every friend of yours so maybe this pandu can connect with four friends maximum 
if another pandu comes also it will be very congested for that pandu so four friends is the maximum space which this particular pandu can make so more friends means more happiness more stability so think of these like the atoms think of this like the atoms and the friendship bond is like the actual chemical bond which is there between the atoms so can i say the more the number of bonds more the number of bonds i would say it will lead to more stability more stability more stability more happiness and less less energy of the system less energy of that particular system remember whenever something is stable something is happy it is at a lower energy state like when you are sleeping you are at a low energy state when you are active you are at a high energy state that's how you should look at it correct perfect now this is exactly what happens in a liquid and there are two things two types of molecules in a liquid and we'll see that imagine this is a container imagine this is a container there is one set of liquid which is there on the surface and the other set of liquid which is probably I just draw it here like this I hope you can see the color difference out here so this one is called as the surface of a liquid and the other one below it is called as the bulk of the liquid the other part is the solid container the orange one is the solid container why did I separate out these two layers or separate out these two types of liquid because their behavior only is completely different that is what you will see I'll tell you how imagine those liquid molecules on the surface imagine those liquid molecules on the surface these are on the surface the surface is a small layer of few molecules which are exposed to the outer side atmosphere these are the bulk molecules or the atoms of that liquid which are deep inside that particular fluid something like this something like this now why the difference is because of the bonds that they make if you check out if you check out the molecules which are in the bulk they will make a bond here they will make a bond here 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 everywhere example something like this there are molecules everywhere around these and they will make many 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 such bonds right something like this look at the number of bonds that each of these bulk molecules are making so many bonds now let's talk about these molecules which are there on the top I have a feeling that they do not have the ability to make so many bonds because of lack of molecules on the surface because of lack of molecules on the surface there are fewer bonds which these molecules are making because of which if you compare and ask me who is more happy who is more unhappy then I will say that listen these people are really really sad so I will show some sad faces on them they are unhappy because of the less number of interactions bonds that they are making but these pandus below they are definitely much happier because they are making many bonds they have many friends around them they are surrounded by people they are surrounded by bonds so you can see the sadness and the happiness on all their faces is that right my dear warriors yes very good now because of this what happens is you will say that these molecules on the surface are are unhappy or have more energy more energy they have more energy 
I would also say they are less stable. They are less stable. That is what I would say about the surface molecules. Whereas the molecules in the bulk, not only do they have less energy because of more bonds, but at the same time, I would say they are relatively more stable. So, if you now talk about a molecule which is there in bulk, which is very happy versus a molecule which is there on the surface, which is relatively unhappy. Will this molecule want to go over here? No, right? This is very happy. Why would it want to go on the surface? It doesn't want to. It will be unhappy to go over here. It will be not easy to bring it to the surface bring it to the surface definitely not but if you talk about this molecule you ask him to go below it will be very easy to bring it to the bulk bring to the bulk what does this tell you this clearly tells you surface molecules are unhappy they want to go inside and the liquid wants to keep very few people on the outer periphery that is on the surface. See, you cannot eliminate the surface. Surface has to be there no matter what you do. How can a liquid be there without the surface? Is it possible even? No, right? You need to keep, but keep fewer people. Keep fewer people. Always it happens. You are saying something in the family or in the friends. Many people might agree with you. Some people will disagree with you. You always try to make sure that, you know, maximum people are happy and very few people might disagree with you or else if everybody disagrees with you something is wrong with you only same way we will try to keep as many pandus happy as possible so to do that very so a liquid a liquid tries to minimize minimize what does it tries to minimize the surface molecules the surface molecules thereby thereby what does happen thereby reducing reducing its surface reducing its surface when it reduces its surface what happens is it has a tendency it has a tendency to contract it has a tendency to contract and this is what leads to this is what leads to the phenomena of leads to surface tension this is what leads to surface surface tension is that understood my dear warriors is that understood my dear warriors very good so all the molecules on the surface want to come inside the bulk because that's where they are at lower energy states and more stable. And this property of a liquid to minimize its surface is called as the surface tension. It feels as if the liquid is contracting. That is the reason why, that is the reason why if you take water, imagine this is water, this is some liquid in space, immediately what happens is it changes its shape and it becomes like a blob like this it becomes like a blob like this reason is for a given volume for a given volume because the liquid quantity is fixed volume is fixed sphere sphere has the least area has the least area that is the reason why the liquid becomes a sphere in gravity free space in uh, international space station and all that if you have seen blobs of water come you know from the bottle and that is very interesting to see you might be wondering sir why does it not happen on earth well on earth what happens is that on earth what happens is that imagine this is the ground surface if you drop water why will you not see this why you will not see a drop of water like this on earth this why don't you see it? this is 
not possible this is not possible on earth this is not possible on earth why do you not see water behaving in this particular manner see although the area is less the problem is about the center of mass of that system being really high the center of mass is high this creates gravitational potential energy will become very high it might overpower the benefits of lowering the surface area lowering the area reduces the energy on the surface but when you make it like a sphere the center of mass is really apart away or high from the ground level so gravitational energy will be high so total energy wise there might be no benefit in fact negative benefit only instead if this is the surface on ground if the water spreads like this water spreads like this and it stops spreading after a while because if it spreads too much then it will be too much of a surface then the center of mass will come down so this is low center of mass which means low gravitational low gravitational potential energy so it because of gravity that is why it spreads it is not like a sphere it will come down it will collapse into a layer but it does not become too big a layer it does not become too big a layer like this imagine this is the ground surface and imagine water spread like this water spreads like this everywhere throughout that room if it spreads yes this might be much lower this might be much lower gravitational potential energy but the problem is this will make very high surface energy very high surface energy because there will be too many molecules on the surface so this is also not going to happen this is not happening this is not possible this is not possible because of too high surface energy here there is low gravitational energy surface is also not too much so you will see decent decent surface energy is there decent amount of surface energy is there and that is the reason why this is possible that is why the liquid surface is like this it does not spread too much nor does it become a sphere are these two extremities clear why it is not possible and why this is possible everybody with me we will complete this in the next one one and a half hour max got it so what have we done till now we have seen that uh, surface tension depends on the uh, proper is a property of a liquid to contract itself and it depends on the liquid and the temperature and more the molecules make bonds lower is the energy more is the stability the molecules on the surface have very few bonds so less stable and higher energy and that is why the molecules tend to go back inside the bulk trying to minimize the area that's why in space any liquid or blob will become a sphere because it has the least area because it has the least area for a given volume that is very important but on earth it cannot become a blob because high energy of gravity it can't spread too much because then it will become high surface energy so it balances it out compromises both a little bit till whatever is feasible and it will spread decently not too much not too less now talking about talking about how this force of surface tension behaves so imagine this is the surface of a liquid imagine this is the surface of the liquid imagine inside is the bulk this is the bulk then you take any cut on the surface let's say i take a cut here let's say i take a cut here on the surface you will see it's not a actual cut it's just a hypothetical cut in your mind on the paper nothing else not real you will see because the surface wants to contract contraction happens in all the directions every point wants to bring those molecules tuck 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 come 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 let's all go inside so the surface is trying to contract it's trying to shrink so there is a force which is both ways either ways any line that you draw it will experience a force so it will go like this 
uh, let's say for example, let me duplicate this, yeah. If you draw a line here, oops. If you draw a line here or I'll draw a line here, you will see these side particles will get pulled like this, like this, like this, like this. These particles will get pulled like this, like this, like this, like this. These particles will be pulled like this, like this, like this. These particles will be pulled like this, like this, like this. So the forces are there both way. So these are basically your tendency to contract. So contraction, contraction, forces along the surface. Contraction forces along the surface. Very, very crucial. Is that okay? And now there is a formula for that as well. So if you take any random line of length L, then the forces from this side to this side or from this side to this side obviously follow Newton's third law. Action and reaction, Newton's third law. This force along the surface perpendicular to the imaginary length imaginary length which I have drawn is directly proportional is directly proportional to the length that I have drawn is directly proportional to the length that I have drawn so there will be a constant of proportionality f is something into l that constant of proportionality is s some books also use the symbol t some books also use the symbol t both are okay f is equal to sl f is equal to sl what is this s what is this s this s is called as the surface tension surface tension the unit the unit of surface tension you can see newton and this is meter bring it down it will be how many newtons is there per meter if s is more it has higher tendency to contract. If S is very less, it has lower tendency to contract itself. That is what S is. Is that clear? Yeah, F is equal to SL. Now let's, uh, you know, solve some basic questions on that because a lot of questions do come on this. So let's try to take the standard examples. These are standard patterns which have repeated in NEAT and in NCRT as well. So one of the standard pattern of questions is you take a wire frame wire frame with sliding rod with a sliding rod dipped in a film dipped in a film this is a standard pattern of question where this is the rod over here which can slide on this wire frame and there is a beautiful film which is there over here. This is that film. Now what will happen because of this? Think carefully and answer. Any liquid surface always has a tendency to contract. So even this one, if you think about it, if you think about it, this also wants to contract from all the sides. This liquid wants to contract. So it will try to bring this like this. It will try to pull this here. It will try to pull this here. It will try to pull this here. It will try to even pull the other liquid molecules like this, like this, like this. It has a tendency to contract. It has a tendency to contract, obviously. But there is a problem. What is the problem? Not all the things are movable. Remember, remember these elements over here, this one, this one, this one, all these elements, these elements are fixed. They can't slide. But if you talk about this particular element right over here, this element, this is movable. This is movable. So what will happen, my dear students? Because this part, this rod can go here, can go here. This wire frame is a rigid frame. This rod can slide here or here. You have taken that entire thing dipped in that film. The film wants to contract. This rod will tend to go towards the left side. Yes, definitely. You will see then this rod, this rod which is there, 
so therefore what happens is the rod will slide which way towards the left will slide towards the left that is what is going to happen question will be how much is the force what is the acceleration what is the speed so if you find the force you can find the acceleration you can also find the speed by kinematics so let's try to find that out it is not that difficult first of all on this rod there will be a force let's say the length of the rod is l and the force acting on it is f lot of students have seen they write f is equal to sl but i think this is wrong you should understand also why it is wrong see if you look at it in slightly three dimension probably you will understand this is probably the cross section of the rod okay maybe i'll show it like this this is the cross section of the rod this is your film this is your film which is like this this is your film which is like this it is in contact here like this see if you are able to visualize this imagine this in 3d film also has a thickness this is the film thickness film thickness now whenever you have a film visualize this there are two surfaces one on the top one below so technically speaking there will be a force on this part which is on the upper side as well as the bottom part over here which is hidden which is basically hidden right now i cannot show it but there are two kinds of forces which are there one at the top one below so one force on the top is sl one force at the bottom is sl so actually there is two sl force so actually there is two sl force acting on it are you able to visualize this think about it okay everyone let me show this to you again imagine imagine this book to be the film there is a rod here there is a rod here okay think of this pen only as the rod this upper part will apply sl 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 force and the bottom part will also apply sl 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 force so sl here sl here surface tension into length is the force on the upper surface and sl is the force in the bottom surface so total force will be 2 sl there are two surfaces for a film that is the most common mistake which students end up doing got it so two is the problem from this you can also find the acceleration acceleration is force by mass so it will be 2 sl by mass you can also find velocity using u plus at if initial velocity is 0 acceleration is 2 sl by m into t so velocity will be 2 sl by m into t that is the velocity that's how you can find out and solve these kind of problems sometimes the problem can be twisted in slightly different way and what they might tell you hey, listen this wire frame rigid is like this it is like this and that sliding rod is over here and then somebody has attached some mass over here if it is in equilibrium position if it is in equilibrium position find the mass or find the surface tension what is the relation between them so basically at equilibrium what is the condition this is at equilibrium this is at equilibrium what is the condition the answer is simple think about it the force of surface tension will be up and it is not going to be just sl it will be 2 sl and the weight which is mg is going to be down so 2 times sl is going to be just mg 2 times sl is just going to be mg as simple as that right if mass is given you can find s if s is given you can find mass this is the method to solve those problems sometimes they can twist the problem even slightly more and they can tell you you have a rectangular wire frame like this you have a rectangular wire frame and you have this slidable movable rod over here and this part has one liquid film of surface tension s1 and maybe this other part has another type of film another film made of another soapy material of surface tension s2 it is given s2 is more than s1 that is also given 
then what will happen well what happens is visualize this this part of the liquid will try to pull this rod here because this gray part wants to contract so the force over here will be 2 s1 into length this part also wants to contract so that will also apply a force of 2 s2 into l who will be more length is same 2 is same s2 is more so 2 s2 l will be more so what happens is because of that there will be a net force there will be a net force on the rod and the net force on the rod will be none other than 2 s2 l minus 2 s1 l so you can take 2 l common and it will be s2 minus s1 so the one which has more surface tension will pull the rod towards it exactly perfect then you can also have a qualitative question like this where it was given that you have a circular loop and in that it is completely dipped in a film something like this it's completely dipped in a film like this so what happens is you take a thread and oops you take a thread and dip it and leave it over there it will stay there intact so basically a loop of thread in a film in a film held by held by held by what a circular frame held by a circular or basically it could be any shape doesn't matter held by a frame held by a frame it doesn't matter whether it is circular or square what you do is now you take a pin and poke this part first time and second time the outside part so i'll create a duplicate and what is done is you rupture it rupture the pin rupture oh sorry rupture the film rupture the film that's what you're trying to do the first case as well as the second case you are trying to rupture the film but at two different places first time you rupture it here second time you rupture it outside you rupture it outside you rupture the film the moment you rupture the film what happens next is the question so if you rupture the film outside what happens is immediately you will see there is a gap which is created there is a small gap which is oops wow. there is a small gap which is created right over here there is a small gap which is created over here that gap will immediately expand that gap will immediately you will see it will expand because you have ruptured it and within no time this entire part will become empty because all the film will get stuck to the ring or that frame and this liquid film which is there inside that liquid film which is there inside that will pull the frame or sorry will pull this loop inwards like this and within no time and within no time what you are going to see next is just this this will be like this and this thread will be stuck onto each other it will be like a sticky thread like this it will be like a sticky thread like this that is what you're going to see isn't that right because this gray part outside will vanish okay because you have ruptured it it is punctured this part will pull it inside and the liquid will be soaking that thread over there that is how it will look like very good that is what happens in this particular case when you are puncturing it outside when you are puncturing it outside that is what happens what happens when you puncture it inside what happens when you puncture it inside well again you will see there is a gap which is created immediately the gap will expand 
like this because the liquid will try to stick to the thread all right the film will be destroyed but this time the surface tension from the outer part will pull it like this the surface tension from the outer part will pull it like this and within no time what you are going to see what you are going to see is the loop will be pulled as much as possible but it can't stretch beyond the limit so most likely you are going to see this You are going to see this is that right because it has been pulled from all the sides like this beyond this it can't stretch itself that is how it will look like so this kind of question can also come how will the loop look like if it is punctured inside versus if it is punctured outside so here the thread is soaked here the thread here the thread is soaked it has absorbed the liquid is soaked in that liquid that is what you will see clear my dear warriors very 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 interesting problems that you are seeing then there is one more type of problem which i would like you to pay attention to and this is also the reason why you might have seen certain insects can float in water not because they are less dense than water but because of surface tension you might have seen those big spiders or some insects with long thin legs they can walk on water yeah they can walk on water like crazy and you get fascinated how the hell are they doing that number one they are very light number two their long legs help in them and they have sticky legs so that they can easily use the phenomena of surface tension to float in water how it happens is basically imagine you take a needle or a long cylindrical kind of an object like this and you leave it on the water surface the surface of the water will become like this this is how it will look like from the sidelines this is how it will look right and this needle stays there intact what is exactly happening observe this if you look at the cross sectional view this is the metallic rod needle thin leg of that insect whatever you want to call it this is how the liquid layer is if you look at this entire length here as well as behind here as well as behind visualize this one is here the other one is here one is here another one is here it is like this and like this visualize it those two points are on the surface of the liquid this surface of the liquid wants to contract so this point is being pulled here by this surface this is a surface of the liquid but it is not exposed there is solid in contact so do not call it the exposed surface of the liquid this part will be contracted because of this upper layer on this liquid side this liquid wants to contract this liquid wants to contract both of them are trying to pull it apart like this right that is what you will see everybody is able to visualize this but you can see that there will be a not a sharp edge but there will be a slightly blunt edge over there that means it will not be so sharp as i have shown over here it will probably look like this if you see it in detail or something like this actually something like this over there and that blandiness is there like this not like this not like this because those legs of that insect are sticky in nature sticky means the water will stick to that solid surface that is why you will not see this kind of curvature you will see this kind of a curvature you will see this kind of a curvature 
so because of that kind of curvature what you will see is that this part will experience a force like this this part will experience a force like this this is sl this is also sl l is the length of that rod and these two forces together balance the weight so two times sl will be the weight that is how the rod is able to stay there intact so that small curvature pulls that liquid up and it will prevent that solid from sinking below very very amazing phenomena and this is how insects like spiders and those uh, weird names i don't know what they are called but they can walk on water using the phenomena of surface tension so you have seen a lot of problems on surface tension phenomena and their forces and their acceleration and velocities and all of these things these are standard questions the next type of standard question comes on surface energy we know that the uh, molecules molecules on the surface have or are at higher energy levels higher energy levels than than the bulk molecules than the bulk molecules this extra energy this extra energy is called as the surface energy of the liquid of that particular liquid there is a formula also for that but before that very important thing if area is zero then energy is also zero if there is no area only exposed hypothetically then there is obviously no energy which is going to be associated with it the derivation for that is very very straightforward you take a wire frame like this you take this particular rod like this make this rod go from here to let's say over here like that it has moved by x amount so earlier the area which was exposed was over here but now because you have moved it there is some extra area which has now been exposed so there is extra energy involved in that surface in doing so you have applied an external force like this which was balanced by the force of surface tension which is 2sl which is balanced by the force of surface tension which is 2sl so f external is nothing but 2 times of sl so that extra energy which came into the surface is because my external force has done some work when i pull it i am doing work and that work got stored in the surface of that fluid which has been newly freshly created how much is the work done i will say it is external force into the displacement but wait a minute external force magnitude is 2sl so 2sl into x now what i will do i'll just write it as s into 2 l x what is this l x l is the length x is the width so l x is basically this area but do not forget it is a film it is a film my dear warriors so many people forget that it is a film and once it is a film remember there are two areas one on the back and one at the front do not forget that do not forget that so there is one area at the back one area at the front so there are basically two areas so there are two surfaces two surfaces so the total new area which is formed isn't it lx into 2 which is basically 2lx which is basically 2lx exactly so 2lx is the total area which has been created so s into a or basically i can call it delta a so delta u of the surface of the surface is s delta a this is the main formula this is the main formula 
remember that delta a is the new area which has been created which is a new area which has been created so that is why i will just simply use this formula usa u is equal to sa a is the area which is exposed s is the surface tension u is the surface energy so remember united states of america united states of america that's it you will get the answer okay we'll do some questions on this from this chapter you can expect one question to two questions four marks to eight marks yep now usually you should not ask such questions because what happens is if you say like that are sir one question only will come two questions will come four marks eight marks next chapter will come sir how many questions two questions okay eight marks only no 720 marks i have okay sir this chapter three questions okay maybe i can leave it three 12 marks one question only leave this chapter if you keep adding 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 like that you will end up leaving over the entire syllabus so don't do that okay never think sir only one question is come now should i do this topic or not less time remaining no there is still time it's march you have entire april to cover up you know the revision part to do the mock test you have time first complete the syllabus now complete the syllabus as much as possible right correct now what kind of questions can you expect from this yes we'll we'll talk about it see imagine okay by the way what is the difference between a drop and a bubble because those kind of questions are very popular over here uh so a drop of a liquid means inside there is liquid inside there is liquid outside there is air bubble can be of two types one is the bubble is in a liquid the bubble is in a liquid like when you boil water you might see bubbles of water right and that is on one way so there is a liquid outside here this was the liquid part and the another bubble that you can think of is bubble in air bubble in air so this is a film this is a film inside and outside there is air so there is air over here there is air over here there is air over here there was air over here these are the two kinds of bubbles that you can get this is bubble this is bubble inside a liquid this is bubble in air this is a drop of water these distinctions should be very very clear in your head when you talk about drop of a liquid in air or drop of a water there is only one surface which is exposed keep this in mind one surface which is open that convex surface is open to the air bubble in liquid also has the inner surface so one uh, i would say inner surface inner or rather one inner surface which is exposed to the air this was i can say one outer surface which is exposed here there is inside surface and outside surface two surfaces are there so there are two surfaces two surfaces one is in and one is outside so that is something which you should keep in mind that is a difference uh, between you know bubble in air and bubble in a liquid all right so all the three different types of behavior i have explained over here for a drop one outer surface for bubble in a liquid then there is one inner surface for bubble in air there is one surface inside one surface convex outside concave and convex both are there what is the mean by film will you please give some example see film means uh, have you seen in a fair they take one small straw they put it in one black cup and then you do and you see those bubbles that bubble is made of a film that is exactly what a film is yes that film is curved but imagine even when you are having bath you can try this with some soapy water you know put some soap and probably put it on your hand and you slightly open up your hand you can get some nice films also on your hand yes you can or between your fingers you put some soap and nice watery soapy material and you open it you will see a nice triangular film 
between your hand or fingers so that is basically a film a film has two surfaces because there is one side and this side over here it's like heads and tails heads and tails understood got it that is the meaning of a film okay great so basically the kind of questions that you can get is the standard pattern like eight drops right uh, are formed from a single drop of a liquid of surface tension s right uh, question is find the energy needed to disassociate so there was a big drop you are disassociating uh, disassociating it that means you are separating it out and making it into small small drops what is the what is the energy needed to do this particular process very straightforward let's try to understand it okay first of all imagine uh you know this is that big drop let's say the radius is r surface tension is s you make it into small small drops eight drops like that each drop has a radius r so like that there are eight drops in this process what happens is that no matter how many drops you make the volume is going to be conserved volume is basically going to be conserved it is going to be constant whatever volume of liquid was there matter was there that matter is distributed total amount is the same so first thing to do in those problems is finding the new radius after that you do the other things so let's say the radius is r so the volume initially will be 4 by 3 pi r cube is equal to is equal to 4 by 3 pi small r cube but into 8 such drops or the total volume 4 by 3 pi 4 by 3 pi will cancel and what you will get is basically capital r cube is 8 small r cube so capital r is 2 times of small r that is what you want to get or rather you can also say small r is uh, original radius by 2 the radius has been halved the volume has become 1 8th because r cube is there once you do this then finding the energy will be very straightforward how observe this i told you usa united states of america delta u is s delta a change in the area so the energy needed to do so is delta u which will be s into the final minus initial area the difference of the areas the final area will be of the eight drops so eight drops area so eight into four pi small r square that is the total surface area of those eight drops minus minus the area of the initial drop which is four four pi capital r square remember surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r square right that is the formula but wait a minute i know small r small r is capital r by 2 small r over here i know is capital r by 2 i'll make use of that fact and then solve the problem okay so therefore energy will be s then 4 pi is also there 4 pi is also there and uh, over here i will get 8 into r square by 4 minus r square 8 by 4 is 2, 2 minus 1 is 2. So this will become S into 4 pi into uh, R square. That's it. So it will become 4 pi S R square is the energy. 4 pi S R square is the energy. Is that clear? So Chandu, what happened is in this problem, there was a drop and you broke it into small drops. When you break it into small drops, the area will increase. So surface energy will increase. So you will have to do some work. You have to provide some energy to increase the surface. 
so question was exactly that to break the drop into small drops how much energy will you give so all you had to do is basically first of all conserve the volume you said that listen 4 by 3 pi r cube 4 by 3 pi r cube is 4 by 3 pi r cube but into 8 because there were 8 such drops from that you got the new radius is old radius by 2 that is clear second delta u is s delta i i got it from here delta u is s delta i got it from here the change in the energy is surface tension into the change in the area that's all so final area is 8 into this initial area is 4 pi r square take the difference you get the answer i hope now it is very very clear right perfect perfect there is one more question which was asked previously it is asked in previous year need question is finding the find the work done to expand a bubble to expand a bubble to double its radius to double its radius this question has also come in the neat exam see if there is a bubble and you are expanding it to double the radius in this situation what is happening the area is increasing so when you are blowing air that work done by that you are blowing action is increasing the energy of the surface molecules don't want to stay on the surface they want to collapse but you are forcing them to go uh, on to the surface so your work is increasing the surface energy so can i just say that my work done by external agency is increasing the surface potential energy and that delta u is s into delta a so s into delta a what is that delta a going to be final minus initial area final area you will be like sir it is 4 pi into 2 r whole square what is the initial area you will be like sir it is 4 pi into r square because this was r and this was 2r but that is not the correct answer can you figure out why this is not correct why this is not correct there is some problem here you know what is the problem can you figure out the problem this is not the correct expression The reason why this is not correct is because this is a bubble and I just told you about bubbles. Bubble in air has two surfaces, inner and outer. So inner surface is 4 pi r square, outer surface also same radius roughly because film thickness is negligible, right? So that is also 4 pi r square. So it is actually into 2. So the area of a bubble, this will be into 2. This will be also into 2 because there are two surfaces two surfaces remember there is one surface here and the other surface over here both in and out so that is the most common mistake which is done by many people out here so that's why you will see the answer will be changed if you do not take that two into account so this will become basically uh, okay i can take four pi outside four pi let me take it outside even r square let me take outside even 2 i can take it outside so 2 square is 4 and this is just 1 over here so 3 8 3 is 24 so 24 s pi r square that is the work done by the external agent many people get the answer as 12 s pi r square which is completely wrong which is completely wrong correct got it so that is this kind of questions on bubbles and drops uh, and energy and forces now there is one more category of questions that you get for bubbles and drops let me come to that as well and for that you need to understand something called as the pressure difference between concave and convex surface see imagine there is a bed sheet 
right imagine there is a bed sheet separating out a room into two equal parts or two parts what happens is imagine this side pandu has created a lot of pressure of air by blowing air or something he has blown air he has created a lot of pressure here there is very little pressure or low pressure over here there is low pressure over here but because there is high pressure over here high pressure over here what will happen this bed sheet or this sheet will bend like this right it will bend like this right you will probably see some bending happening like this everybody you will see this part will be concave this part will be convex if this side pressure is more then the bed sheet or the sheet will bend that side this will be concave that will be convex but every single time what will you see the pressure always on the concave side is higher on the convex side is less so exactly that's what happens whenever a liquid surface is curved you will automatically see there will be a pressure difference which will be there and that is the reason why it is curved or the curvature creates the pressure difference that's how you should think if it is flat then there is no pressure difference at all so that is why i will say for a flat liquid surface for a flat liquid surface pressure here and pressure here will be same there is no pressure difference there is no pressure difference at all there is no pressure difference at all but the moment the surface is like this there is some liquid here or liquid there doesn't matter you will see the pressure on the concave side is higher as compared to the pressure on the convex side that difference is called as the excess pressure excess pressure and that delta p which is p concave minus p convex is given by is given by two times of surface tension divided by r where r is nothing but the radius of curvature of that curved surface r is nothing but the radius of curvature of the curved surface as simple as that is that clear so this is called as the excess pressure which is there between concave and convex surface i've just explained you why concave is going to push that surface and it will exert its higher pressure on the surface and it will push it inside convex is where it faces the dent faces the depression because there is like a suction it pulls in that surface clear this concept we can use it for bubbles and drops this concept we can use it for bubbles and drops definitely so coming back over here if you tell there is a drop and there is liquid inside this is concave the outer one is convex so can i say that the pressure inside is is more than the outside pressure so p in minus the outside pressure by how much there is one surface it has some radius right it has some radius right like this it has some radius it has some radius the liquid has some surface tension so by how much it is having a difference of 2s by r pressure inside the drop is 2s by r more by the outside pressure so this is the inside pressure this is the outside air which is there clear my dear warriors exactly same thing for this bubble in the liquid obviously inside pressure will be more than the outside pressure again because this is on the concave side the outer part is on the bulged side which is convex side so here also i can use the same formula here also i can use the same formula and i can just say p in 
minus p out is 2s by r there is no uh, difference at all so this is still going to be valid a problem happens for a bubble in air see the problem is inside outside inside there are two exposed surfaces there are two exposed surfaces here there was one surface only one surface only so that is why if you count pressure in and subtract it with pressure out it won't be 2s by r it will be 4s by r this is the formula for the pressure difference for a bubble which is present in air for a bubble which is present in air got it yes krishna correct perfecto all these are very very important formulas mainly people confuse with that number 2 or number 4 see whenever there is one single surface separating liquid and air it is 2s by r but there is air liquid and again air air liquid and again air then it becomes 4s by r that's the only difference so let's see some questions based on this what kind of questions can come there is a famous question which has been repeated in neat j everywhere and the question looks like this there is one bubble of radius r1 another bubble of radius r2 they both meet exchange their internal gases and they become one single big bubble they become one single big bubble of radius r question is find r question is find find r that is the question how to solve this particular question assume that there is vacuum outside there is vacuum outside that is what is given two bubbles merge together and you know without any exchange of gases from outside only internal exchange is happening and they become a big bubble no loss of energy no loss of gases is happening how to solve this particular question well first of all i feel volume will not be concerned lot of people do this and they say sir volume 1 plus volume 2 is volume 3 this is not true because pressure here here and here are not the same so you cannot conserve volume for sure so volume conservation out of the box because pressure is not same pressure is not same so you cannot just add the volumes because once the gases mix the pressure will change everything will change <coughs> what then what else can we do there's only one thing which we can do i feel it is yep you can't just add the radius r1 plus r2 is r no the only thing you can do is moles number of moles of gas here plus number of moles of gas here is the total number of moles moles are conserved moles are going to be conserved because the molecules of the gas can't escape into vacuum they are just exchanging within each other they are trapped what is moles pv is nrt so n is pv by rt so this will be p1 v1 by rt plus p2 v2 by rt is equal to pv by rt what happens is you will see rt 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 will get cancelled this p1 is the pressure inside this p2 is the pressure inside this p is the pressure inside that gas and pressure inside a bubble we know the formula pressure inside the bubble is 4s by r plus the outside pressure but wait a minute outside pressure is going to be zero because there is vacuum because there is vacuum so p1 will be basically zero plus 4s by your r1 4s by r1 v1 is nothing but 4 by 3 pi r1 cube that is what it is plus p2 outside pressure 0 plus 4s by r2 volume 4 by 3 pi r2 cube next p over here this pressure is outside pressure which is 0 plus 4s by r next volume is nothing but 4 by 3 pi r cube 4 by 3 pi r cube you will see many things are just going to cancel out each other 
at many 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 places observe 4s 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 4 pi by 3 4 pi by 3 4 pi by 3 cancel r1 with this r1 cube will make it r1 square r2 with this r2 cube will make it r2 square r with this r cube will make it r square so what you will be left out with what you'll be left out with is only this much you will have i think i'll put it on this page only you will be left out with r1 square plus r2 square is equal to r square so r will be a root of r1 square plus r2 square like pythagoras theorem but don't say something foolish like sir is there a triangle which is formed which is right angle hypotenuse sir i thought so sir pythagoras that is absolute rubbish it is just coincidence r square is r1 square plus r2 square looks like pythagoras but it is not okay it's a beautiful question i hope you guys understood it now yes conservation of moles perfect all right cool now let's go to capillary rise but before we go to capillary rise we need to study this concept called as angle of contact adhesion and cohesion and all of this that is the last part of this chapter then this entire mechanical properties of fluid is done for sure one question from this entire lecture today will come in the NEET 2024 exam and if you know there is a chance you might get up to two questions uh, three questions is a very very rare thing yeah but it can happen oh, who knows anything can happen right so on an average two questions one question for sure three is very very rare but yeah eight marks though in your pocket just from today's lecture now see Now, there are two peculiar forces that I want to talk about. One is called as cohesion, cohesion, and the second one is called as adhesion. Cohesion, co means together, and cohesion is a force which is there between similar molecules, similar molecules. Adhesion is between two different types. So it is the force of uh, attraction repulsion which is there between molecules of different kind. If these are water molecules or liquid molecules and these are the molecules of the container. So where the liquid touches the solid surface, you will see that the liquid molecule with liquid molecule will be having cohesion bonds with each other these are cohesive forces between them the bonds are cohesive in nature same way even between this solid and this solid even between this solid the actually the bonds are stronger so i am showing little bit more solid lines over here this is between the molecules of the solids they are of similar kind so that is cohesion bond molecules of the same type molecules of the same type but molecules of different type the bond is addition like here 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 maybe there is some bond here also here also okay it could be like this so this is addition this is cohesion is this clear everybody with me understood okay now what happens is what happens is that yeah these forces of cohesion and addition could be of different proportions for different liquids and solids so when you take a container and pour some liquid in it pour some liquid in it i am focusing on this part 
I am focusing basically on this particular part. I hope this is very, very clear. I am focusing on this particular part. This is our region of interest. If it so happens that you are cohesion, there are three possibilities cohesion, cohesion, cohesion is less than adhesion cohesion is roughly similar similar to adhesion lastly cohesion is much more than adhesion these are the only three possibilities that you can get these are the only three possibilities that you can get my dear warriors so for the first possibility what will happen for the next possibility what will happen and for the third possibility what will the region of interest look like because because here cohesive forces are weak addition liquid and solid attracts better you will see that to take the solid surface the liquid surface will climb onto it because it sticks to it because it sticks to it so the liquid surface will look like this liquid surface will look like this if cohesion and adhesion are roughly the same not much of difference between them then neither will it go up neither will it come down the liquid surface will roughly look flat only will roughly look flat only if cohesion is more than adhesion then what you will also see is that the liquid surface will look like this basically liquid loves liquid not the solid cohesion means of similar kind they love each other not adhesion so they will be not liking the solid they will tend to go away from it they will tend to stick together flock together that is how it looks like so these are the three possibilities that you can get these are the three possibilities that you can get yeah so study cohesion uh, you can think like this okay let me go back over here see these are water molecules water water will attract repel that is cohesive force the water molecule with another water molecule there is a very weak bond imagine this is a copper container copper molecules will exert some force between them that is cohesion force but copper attracting water molecule water attracting copper molecule that is adhesive force the bond which is there between them is adhesion bond is that clear so similar kind or different kind that is what defines whether it is cohesive or adhesive so when you apply a glue it is said to be adhesive why is it said to be adhesive because it will stick together two surfaces of different kinds also got it so adhesive is a, a glue or a, a sticky thing which can stick together two surfaces of different kinds that's all Great. So now coming back over here, coming back over here, the example for this, the example for this, <clears throat> the example for this is, you know, if this is example, this is water and the solid here is made of glass. You will see the surface is going to be concave up the meniscus. Sometimes this is also called as the surface of the fluid or the meniscus the meniscus the meniscus meniscus means surface of the liquid is concave up is basically concave upward meniscus is concave upward here the meniscus is flat the meniscus is flat example is if you pour water in a silver container you will see this will ha happen silver adhesion and water cohesion is roughly same so silver and water you will see the flatness will be there here the example is if you take a glass container but instead of water you pour mercury you pour mercury so here i would say the meniscus which is the surface of that liquid is convex up convex bulging 
is convex upward convex up here it is concave caving upward is the difference between the three clear is the difference between the three very very clear study krishna very good excellent eh? awesomeness now now there is a term which we use to define whether it is up flat or down or uh, convex is up and that term is called as the angle of contact that term is called as the angle of contact meaning imagine imagine there is a solid surface there is a solid surface and there is a liquid surface there is a liquid surface if you draw a tangent to the liquid surface and tangent to the solid surface at the point of intersection but you have to measure it inside the liquid only not outside this is not correct only inside the liquid then that angle is called as the angle of contact angle of contact please don't measure this this is wrong this is correct because this is inside the liquid same way if i have a solid surface here and maybe there is a drop of the liquid like this which is being held over there drop of the liquid is here draw tangents one tangent here and the other tangent over here measure the angle inside the liquid that is the angle of contact that is the angle of contact and that is the correct angle of contact which you will get but if you measure over here that is wrong is that clear that is angle of contact so in this particular example which we saw cohesion is less than addition did you not see my dear warriors that the angle of contact over here theta is basically acute theta is acute is that right theta is acute here can you see the angle of contact the tangents drawn are perpendicular so theta is basically 90 degree theta is basically 90 degree here if you notice this is the angle of contact it is obtuse so don't you see theta is just more than 90 degree or basically it is obtuse theta is basically obtuse everybody with me on this very good perfecto perfecto so angle of contact depends on the pair of the medium pair of the medium pair of the medium if cohesion is more it is obtuse like mercury in glass if addition is more then it sticks and you will see that theta is acute if both are identical then it is flat so it is 90 degree so this concept you should understand to understand the next concept of capillary rise or capillary fall till this point if it is clear let me know guys everybody with me sir in addition more than cohesion concave uh, up or concave down addition more than cohesion is concave up this is concave up addition is more so it is like this it is like this it is concave is pointing up here convex surface is on the upper side this surface is convex that is up okay clear okay now <clears throat> this concept leads us to capillary rise and capillary fall how liquid can go up in a tube or fall down in a tube because of only this angle of contact and cohesion and adhesion forces it also involves this concept of pressure difference across concave and convex surface all these things are involved now all these things together will help you understand capillary rise and capillary fall let's understand this let's understand this first of all <clears throat> okay imagine okay imagine there is a tube imagine there is a tube this tube which is small and open on both sides is called as a capillary 
सो द मीनिंग ऑफ द वर्ड कैपिलरी इज अ ओपन नैरो ट्यूब नैरो ट्यूब इज बेसिकली कॉल्ड एज अ कैपिलरी ओके इट्स ओपन ऑन बोर्ड साइड इट्स वेरी स्मॉल रेडियस डायमीटर बट इट इज लॉन्ग दैट इज कॉल्ड एज अ कैपिलरी नाउ यू मेक द कैपिलरी आउट ऑफ ग्लास एंड यू पोर सम वॉटर हियर सो लेट से द सर्फेस ओवर हियर बिकम स्टिकी लाइक दिस बिकम स्टिकी लाइक दिस वॉटर ऑल्सो स्टिक्स टूगेदर सो यू कैन सी देर इज अ ब्यूटिफुल कॉन कॉन्केव अप सर्फेस विच इज फॉर्म्ड कॉन्केव अप सर्फेस विच इज फॉर्म्ड राइट लेट्स डू दिस विद एग्जाम्पल सो दैट यू आर वेरी वेरी क्लियर इमेजिन द प्रेशर ऑफ एटमोसफियर द प्रेशर ऑफ एटमोसफियर वी नो इज वन ए टी एम इज वन ए टी एम करेक्ट एंड इन साइड द लिक्विड यू शुड अगेन हैव द सेम लेवल ऑफ प्रेशर सेम लेवल ऑफ प्रेशर एंड एटमोस्फेरिक प्रेशर एक्सर्ट फ्रॉम आउटसाइड सो फ्रॉम द आउटसाइड ओवर हियर फ्रॉम द आउटसाइड ओवर हियर लेट मी जस्ट ड्रॉ इट अगेन From the outside over here, you will experience one atm pressure, and we all know at the same level of of a liquid, the pressure should be same, or else it will not be a static scenario. It will not be an equilibrium scenario because this is concave up, because this side is on the concave side, and this side below is on the convex side. shouldn't the pressure below be slightly less than 1 atm shouldn't the pressure over here over here maybe i'm just taking some example maybe it is 0.98 atm maybe it is 0.98 atm oh that creates a problem just here and just here the pressure should be actually equal in fact just below over here if you go down in the water the pressure might even increase to 1.02 1.01 atm how is there a pressure difference at the same level this doesn't make sense this is low pressure this is high pressure this is low pressure this is high pressure can you see that my dear warriors everybody is able to understand it if you want i will draw a big diagram if you want i will draw a big big diagram if you want imagine this is that tube of that capillary okay and this is the water which is there outside and the water inside is making a curved surface in fact even the outer surface outer part of the water will also look like this only and this curvature will be more prominent inside rather than outside it will look like this here the pressure is here at this point the pressure is 1 atm here also the pressure is 1 atm maybe here the pressure might be very close to 1 atm just below just below here the pressure will be maybe 0.98 atm this is the problem this is the problem because you are on the convex side over here and this side is the concave side that creates the problem so because of which low pressure high pressure immediately you will see the liquid will flow here the liquid flows and pushes it up it will push this up it will push this up and the moment it starts pushing it up what will happen pressure will build up at this point pressure will build up at this point because of the column of the liquid after some time it could happen that after some time it could happen something like this this is the liquid outside this liquid has gone till here this liquid has gone till here okay. just imagine this point the pressure is 1 atm this point is just below on the convex side so maybe it is 0.98 atm because only it is on the convex side the curvature will create the difference this is on the concave side this point 
is obviously at 1 atm we all know inside a liquid the pressure should be same everywhere so even this point shouldn't it have a pressure of 1 atm my dear warriors how will this 1 atm come see when you go from here to here when you go from here to here there is hydrostatic pressure which will build up and what if the hydro hydrostatic pressure is exactly 0 0.02 atm so 0 0.98 plus 0 0.02 will make it back to 1 atm so the level of the liquid will rise till such a point so if the pressure has dropped by 0 0.02 the hydrostatic pressure will compensate it by increasing the pressure at this point and that's how pressure will be equalized so then there will be no flow of liquid because they are equal pressures that is why there will be no flow of liquid because of equal pressures equal pressures so liquid will not flow this is the reason why a liquid rises inside a capillary is this concept very very clear is this concept very very clear how liquid rises this is true if the angle of contact is obtuse if it is uh, sorry if it is acute if it is obtuse then instead of rising it will come down in fact the diagram for it looks something like this so if you take mercury inside the glass if you take mercury inside the glass then it looks something like this you will see the mercury convex meniscus is up so if this is 1 atm right this point will also be open to the atmosphere so 1 atm this point might be 1.04 atm example because it is on the concave side do not forget this is on the convex side this point and this point should have the same pressure this point and this point should have the same pressure because they are at the same level they are at the same level so same level they should have the same pressure no doubt about it so how can this point be at 1.0 for atm if only when you go down the hydrostatic pressure hydrostatic pressure increases it by 0 0.04 atm so then you will see this point will also have 1.04 atm pressure so this height difference is compensating for that excess pressure because of the concave convex difference is that very very clear is that absolutely clear why the liquid goes down when it is obtuse and why does it climb up when it is acute these are proper diagrams which will help you understand this concept now deriving that result is very simple if you understand it till here i'll tell you how imagine you take a capillary tube okay i'll take some liquid doesn't matter whether it is water or mercury and this is the surface over here and uh, we all know that at this point the pressure is p naught this point also the pressure is p naught at this point the pressure is p naught but it is on the convex side so minus 2s by the radius of curvature at this point because you have come down by some height h that pressure will be p naught minus 2s by r will be there plus rho g h plus rho g h this should be the pressure at this point but we all know that these two points are at the same height so their pressures must be equal same height pressures must be equal so therefore p naught is equal to p naught minus 2s by r plus rho g h p naught p naught cancels bring 2s by r on the other side so 2s by r is a rho g h so h will be 2s by rho g r but that is not the end of the road because 
there is a small catch in this derivation. I know the surface tension, I know the density of liquid, I know the gravity, but I don't know R. You might be thinking, sir, obviously I know R. No, you don't know the value of R. I'll tell you why. See, this is the capillary tube. I have to understand there is a difference between the radius of the tube versus radius of the meniscus. This R is the radius of the curvature of the meniscus. So, when I show this particular meniscus, let's say over here. Actually, it will be a part of a big circle like this over here. This is your capital R. This is the radius of that curvature of that meniscus. What I would know most likely is the radius of the capillary tube, this small r. And are they related to each other? Definitely they are. Just draw this line like this. You will see this is a right angle triangle. Second thing, you know this is the angle of contact. This is the angle of contact, correct? So if this is theta, can you guess what might this angle be? Obviously, that angle will be 90 minus theta. Now, we all know this is radius, this is tangent. This is radius, this is tangent. So, this is basically 90 degree. Or for this circle, this is radius, this is like that uh, circumference. So that will be perpendicular. So, if this pink line, sorry, pink angle is 90 minus theta. How much will this be? How much will this particular angle be? Think about it. Because this is 90, this is 90 minus theta, obviously this will be theta. Because theta plus this will make it 90 degree. Oh, perfect. So now I can see in this particular triangle, cos theta is small r by capital R. So capital R is small r by cos theta. Capital R is small r by cos theta. I'll again mention the difference. This is radius of curvature of meniscus that is the curved surface meniscus this small r is the radius of capillary radius of capillary they are two different things they are two different things that is what i got so capital r is small r by cos theta so capital r is small r is small r by cos theta therefore height will be 2s cos theta by rho g small r this is the formula for height rise in a capillary theta is the angle of contact which will be given to you theta will be angle of contact which is given to you is that clear very very important very very important also you will see one more thing in this particular formula that is if theta is acute versus theta is obtuse. Theta is acute, that means cos theta will be positive. Theta is obtuse means cos theta will be negative. Cos theta will be negative. That means height will be positive. Here height will be negative. So it will rise up. Like in the case of water in glass, here it will fall down. Here it will fall down. Another important thing which you should note in that formula is that because the height rise is 2s cos theta by rho g r, height is inversely proportional to the radius. Meaning, imagine I take a big capillary. Then I take a decently sized capillary and then I take a very very thin capillary all these I immerse in a liquid all of this I immerse in a liquid what I will see is maybe in the wider one where the radius is more height will be less so maybe it will hardly go up by this much as the radius decreases height will increase maybe it will go up by this much in the smallest radius, maybe the height will be even more. 
maybe the height will be even more so this is what you will see in case of different uh, sizes of the capillary tubes and this is the exact phenomena which is used for sucking or drawing water from the roots to the top of a tree so a xylem is a narrow tube how is the plant or a tree able to suck that water from the ground is because of this capillary action so capillary action at play means you take thin tubes and you immerse it in the water that water will be sucked up only through the capillary effect so this is called as your capillary effect all right this is also called as your capillary capillary effect and the one of the best application is uh, sucking water sucking water from the bottom <clears throat> to the top in a xylem in plants okay this is one of the good effects correct another important thing is you might get a question where the tube is like this and the water goes up till certain height let's say h and in the same liquid maybe somebody holds the tube incorrectly incorrectly making some angle making some angle then what will happen you will see the height will still remain the same the height will still remain the same but since the markings are there on the tube over here you might end up measuring a wrong value so the marking that you will end up measuring is this one which is h apparent this is not the true height because of the inclination you are measuring a wrong value and let's say you have tilted the tube by an angle theta then h apparent cos theta is small h or rather h apparent will be h by cos theta that is something again which you should be aware of is that very very clear everybody with me so sometimes you might get problems where the tubes are at an angle and you measure the apparent height another interesting question which comes in the examination is where a capillary tube is dipped in a liquid but this is happening in space what do you think will happen in space in space what do you think will happen in space remember our gravity is not there so if you go by the formula h is equal to 2s cos theta by rho g r by rho g r then what will happen is because gravity tends to zero and h is inversely proportional to g and this is tending to zero lot of you will conclude h is infinity fair enough mathematically this is fine but what is the meaning of h is infinity does that mean that this water will become like a fountain it will try to go up and it will go like that no that is not true it means water will go up as much as possible infinity is just a limit mathematically physically the limit is only till here so it will completely fill this part up so it will completely fill this part up as much as possible it won't become a fountain that is stupidity to think that it will become a fountain this is what is going to happen in a gravity free environment it will completely fill up that tube is that absolutely clear understood yep it is not going to become a fountain very very interesting thing then there is one more type of question which comes in capillary tube and that is a question on insufficient length insufficient length of the tube insufficient length of the tube meaning imagine you had a tube like this and the liquid went up till this height this height is basically h everything is given surface tension is given radius is given everything is given somebody somebody gives you a tube which is not even of height h 
it is much lesser than that and let's say it was given to you that angle of contact was not 90 sorry 0 degree angle of contact was 0 degree so if angle of contact is 0 degree it will become like a perfect hemisphere over here nice hemisphere okay somebody gives you an insufficient length and the tube is more inside of water than outside now what will you do now the tube only is just h by 2 outside the water surface this is the question insufficient length the length was at least supposed to be h but you are giving it h by 2 h by 3 h by 4 doesn't matter now a lot of people again say sir the liquid wants to be here so again we will get a fountain the liquid will try to go up oh more space is there i will go up and it will fall down that is not true again again go by the formula that will give you an idea h is 2s cos theta by rho g r this was there initially cos was 0 cos of 0 cos of 0 will make it 1 so h was 2s by rho g r this was initially you know what is the problem in the second case height is now h it is h by 2 so next time if you substitute h by 2 put 2s cos theta i don't know what theta is by rho g r think what will happen just substitute h as 2s by rho g r just substitute h as 2s by rho g r over here and this 2 is also there this 2 from here is also here right this 2 from here so this will become 2s cos theta by rho g r 2s 2s cancel rho g r rho g r cancel what will i get i will get cos theta is half that means theta is 60 degree oh this just tells you the liquid won't come up infinitely or it will not become like a fountain rather when it comes up the angle of contact only will change the curvature will change that's all so it will come and stop over here instead of being very curved it will become little bit less curved because angle of contact has become 60 degree from 0 degree it is becoming more flatter earlier it was zero now it is becoming more towards 60 degree more flat so it is going to become like that yeah so theta is going to change theta is going to change this is another variety of problem which you might get in the neat examination so we have done many varieties uh, i will keep some homework problems for all of you there are some homework these are ncrt problems these are very very straightforward all these things we have done radius is changed from uh, r to 2r we just did this right uh, liquid does not wet the solid surface what does it mean that means it is not sticking that means adhesion is less cohesion is more what does it mean right all these problems basic questions are there over here and about angle of contact so just try to solve these questions it is going to be there in your pdf which is going to be uh, given to you on the telegram channel where is the telegram channel the link is there in the description box so as you are particularly watching this video as you are watching this video and you check up the description box very very important very very important yes check this out the treasure box link is there you also have i think the telegram link should be there somewhere i'm not so sure it's not there okay okay no issues uh, you can check it from any other video also this treasure box is the most important thing for all of you because it has ncrt solutions pyq tests chapter wise pyqs the youtube lecture link it is arranged subject wise and grade wise class 11 separate class 12 separate biology physics and chemistry so you will be able to see all these chapters out here right and you can watch those lectures as much as you want 10 year pyqs list is also there use this link remember you might have to sign in the moment you click any of these links uh, you might have to sign in so create your free account because that way you can make the best use of these resources which are presented to you okay so i hope you enjoyed the class have a great lovely evening and uh, keep studying right 
do not give up on the neat studies just because biology exam is there you have to complete the syllabus as much as possible okay i won't be repeating these lectures again no matter what so yeah that's it you'll have to watch the recording or you have to attend live up to you that's it bye bye captain shares signing off as the